Our story is more than what hobbits and elves know. It's time we told it ourselves. With hammer and axe, we cleanse the world from the shadow of the ring and its master. Yet we dwarves celebrate as a scattered people, cut off from our one true home. Across Middle-earth we mine and sculpt, delving for riches, yet the greatest treasure remains out of our reach. Moria. Durin built it before the first sun rose, and through the ages when darkness threatened our great kingdom, he awoke to lead us again until the Balrog took it all away. That was a thousand years ago, and Durin, Durin the Deathless, has not returned. Some say be patient. I say we wait no longer. It is time to journey from every mountain. Come, rally together. Bring your axes and tools, craft and courage. It is time we dwarves return to Moria. Hey there, gang. I'm Danny J. And I'm Joel N. And I'm Trevor D. And we are Keep On Tolkien. Yay! Hey. Wow, that was cool. That was totally impromptu, and it uh, turned out well. Wow. We, <laughs> I, well might be an overstatement, <laughs> we, but we did maybe. it. We did it. it <laughs> yeah, Welcome, we, everybody. But it gave it our best try. Uh, yeah. Today's episode 93, you can't really tell from uh, you know how professional we are. Right, yeah. You know. But uh, it is episode 93, and we're talking about, uh, uh, what are we talking about today, guys? We're talking about that, that video game, Hell Lord yeah. of the Rings. And for those of you keeping track at home, this is Trevor's second episode that he wrote. Ayo. The last one was the Gollum Game Review, which was a... A, a fantastic episode, in my opinion. I thought you were going to say fantastic game, and I was about to... No, like, no, ooh. the game was horrible. The game was horrible. But the episode was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And today, we're going to be talking about the new Return to Moria game that just came out relatively recently. Yeah. A game that is... It's not going to be as, as much of a rage listen as, no. yeah. as Gollum was. <laughs> just, just right off the bat, if Trevor, if you had to compare the two... Yeah, can, just for well, a second. Just for, in, for like a second. Well, are they even comparable, in your opinion? Like... No, I don't think Gollum is really worth it playing at all. I like. I don't even think if you if you hold love in your ri- in your heart for Lord of the Rings and stuff, I still don't think you should probably play Gollum. It's that bad. <laughs> it's it adds nothing. Yeah. Seems like Gollum struggled to even be a functional game. Where this is a, not only a fully fleshed out game, but a, a relatively good one at that. Yeah, I mean, I would uh, I would agree if you're uh, if you're big on dwarves and Tolkien and just likes like all that stuff in one place that you get to experience. Yeah, it absolutely does a great job. As far as how great it does in the department of its game, I yeah, I think it's kind of mid. Okay. Well, I okay. suppose we're about to get into all. Yeah. That. Yeah. We're about well, that to was the end of the there. episode, guys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks that's for our coming. Re- that's our review. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I'm going to be uh, doing a more of a lore seat because I was writing uh, my sister's wedding while you were <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. while you were playing this game. So I didn't get to see a whole lot of it. It looked really fucking cool from what I saw, but I'm going to be here as a lore consultant and a joke maker. Is that okay? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Sick. Right. Okay. Well, a couple of details about this game just to give you guys information. Uh, it came out on, on October 24th of 2023 for PC. Eventually, it's going to be coming out on consoles. It was developed by Free Range Games and published by North Beach Games. And this game, one of the reasons why I really enjoyed it, so I didn't play through it. I watched Trevor play through it. Um, but one of the things I really enjoyed about watching him play through it was uh, just the very skillful lore and language that was used. And it turns out this game, they had a couple uh, consultants, a couple Tolkien experts that they consulted to help them out with this game. They had uh, the Tolkien professor, which, boo. Yeah, boo. <laughs> we're, not, we're, not, we're not big Tolkien We're not big heads. on Tolkien professor. I know a lot of people really love that guy. His name's Corey Olson. Go check him out if, if you're into it. But uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> You smashed that like button too. Yeah, just plug him. Oh, like, oh my god. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can t- I can talk shit about somebody as long as I plug their project. As long, right as, I, as, long as I plug it, I guess is okay. <laughs> uh, another person they had was a, a fellow named T. S. Uh, Lucart, uh, who is essentially a, an American fantasy science fiction author and a tabletop role game designer. Oh, sick! But probably the most important and the one that I was happiest to see was this fella named David Sallow, who helped work on this game. So they used him as a consultant on this game he helped them essentially with the coos duel all the coos duel the dwarvish language in the game nice and that's how you spell his name s-a-l-o yeah sallow that's 
means so- something solo, else. Solo, solo, salo. Means something else in the horror community. Oh, does it? Yeah, it's a really gross and shitty movie that I just watched for the first time this Halloween. <laughs> oh, yeah. What a coincidence. Gross. Okay. Yeah, I was like, that's how it's spelled? Cool. Yeah, well, all you perverts who've seen Sallow out there, you so, know what I'm talking about. The reason I was so excited to see David Sallow's name is because uh, we already, some of us may already know David Sallow because he was contracted for the Lord of the Rings film trilogy Hell to help yeah. them write all the material in Elvish, particularly the Sindarin and the Coos Duel and some of the other languages that are in there, like the old Westron stuff. He also assisted with all the written languages, so all the Tengwar and the Kurth, and he did the same role in the Hobbit movies, un- unfortunately. Unfortunately. Poor guy. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so he is, he's got a little bit of a reputation with uh, helping develop Tolkien's languages. Yeah, and I have no qualms with his work at this juncture. Yeah, I was thrilled to see that he was a part of it, and you can tell by the, the quality of the lore building and things. So Yeah. Yeah, all the all the coups duel in the in the lore in this game is is really cool. Very cool. Yeah, we're gonna talk about very a bunch spot of it. on. And uh, obviously, this game being called Return to Moria, right? Mm-hmm. It it tells the story of the dwarves coming back to Casa Doom in the Fourth Age. Yeah, you may have kind of gathered that from our opening excerpt, which is pretty great. Uh, we don't get a lot of Fourth Age uh, based stuff. No, I think no. it's I think this is a brilliant setting for a fucking, uh, especially survival crafting game like this is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it was a it was they knocked it out of the park with like choosing their lane. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, but yeah, it's choosing their lane and and staying in it and staying in it. There you go, Trev. Yeah. That's important. Yep. Now that opening excerpt, all the excerpts from this episode today are actually not from texts, but rather from the game itself. And that opening excerpt, was, was that the opening cutscene of the game? Is that what Yeah, that was? yeah. When you boot the game before you even press a button to start it, that's the uh, intro that plays with John Reese davies voice in Gimli, which is awesome. That's right. John oh. Reese davies davies came back for this game. Totally yeah. awesome. Totally awesome. Okay. Well, in this episode, you're going to learn some things. We're going to okay. talk We're going to talk about how the events of the story unfold. We're going to go through some of the lore, both the, the created for the game lore and the inspired lore. Thick. We're going to go over some general gameplay and the way that you interact with the game, as well as our own thoughts and experiences with it. Nice. Yeah, so buckle in, bitches. Yeah. And like with Gollum, I did. You know, I played through the majority of this game uh, and had Danny and Joel kind of hop on some streams and check it out and give their opinions so we could all have at least some impression of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, overall... Like, mostly pretty positive. Yeah. Absolutely. There's yeah. From what I saw, really cool, really cool experience it looked like. I yeah. do plan on getting, while I couldn't afford to pick it up at the time, I do plan on picking this up and playing through. Oh, Joel is going to shit his pants it's over this Even if scare. you could have bought it, you wouldn't have had time, man. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really the big thing. I didn't yeah. have time. We've been super busy the past, like, month. But no, it, it, it's actually super clutch that Trevor was doing this episode because mm-hmm. it would not have got out if it was a Joel or me episode. Yeah. Because Joel was, you were, this is big news you were closing on a house Can oh yeah me and uh, me and my wife mal we uh, recently bought our first house yeah we were moving and stuff and that was hella crazy round of applause and yeah and then my sister was getting married i was officiating and writing the ceremony yeah so, like, you essentially had to like write the way yeah i wrote the whole <laughs> fucking thing yeah uh so me and joel were hella busy and trevor really fucking stepped up here and uh, wrote a great episode so hell yeah it's not hard for me to go you know just face down and in, into a game into a game yeah <laughs> no it's like you 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 analyze these games on a level that i would never be able to do and that's that's fucking awesome Hell well, yeah. I hope that you learn some things too. Oh, I'm going to learn everything. Going to get learnt today. Getting learnt. So we're going to assume, at least to some degree, that you are familiar with dwarves and Casa Doom. Uh, we'll give a refresher on some things, but if you would like a full history outside of the events of the game, uh, we've got some other episodes with dwarves in them you can check out. Yes. Specifically, episodes uh, 29 and 30, dwarves. Dwarves, part yeah, one and two. Specifically about the race two. of dwarves. Yep. And episode 71, the kingdom of Casa Doom. Yes, mm. great <laughs> men turn in that one. Yeah, that was a fu- that was a fun episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a fun episode. Yeah, really fun episode. Both of those are, those are both your episodes, aren't they, Joel? Yes. Hell yes. yeah! So if you're a Joel, if you're a Joel, uh, a Joel head out there, those are both fantastic Joel, Joel episodes. Yeah. The Dwarves is one of the first episodes I think that I was like, all right, Joel is actually really good at writing episodes now. Like, th- yeah, Dwarves was fucking cool, and then Kingdom Kazadun, awesome as well. Thanks, man. Yeah, check those out, guys. So, we're also going to assume that you know some things about uh, dragons, balrogs, and orcs. Oh, my. Luckily for all of you, we just got done with a trilogy on these. So, you know, they come right before this episode. Yeah, just immediately before yeah, it. So. This is 93, so that trilogy was episodes 90, 91, and 92. Go check them out. Friends. Yeah. 
Yeah, not not necessary to know what's going on, but like you'll helpful. Your imagination will go off a lot. Yeah, more. I mean, mm-hmm. given that we're talking about Moria, we do talk about orcs and Balrogs. That's true. And, and we, had... we may end up talking about that third one. Yeah, there's Maybe. At least, there's at least one dragon. Spoilers. Ooh. Spoilers. So let's start with a little backstory on Casa Doom itself. Casa Doom has been mo- known by many names over the years, and these are fun ones too. Uh, we got Casa Doom, of course, which is Kuz Duel. And then the Casarondo, which I think those both mean Mansion of the Dwarves, right? Mm. Casa Doom and Casarondo. Yep. And we've got Had Hodrand, which means Cavern, Dwarvish Cavern or Cavern of the Dwarves. Sick. And then we have, I'm going to butcher it, but I'm going to try it, Furunargian. I think that's right. F- F- Furunargian. Yeah. Furunargian. That's Furunargian. Westron for the same. That's a, such a weird looking word. Mm-hmm. Yeah. P-H-U-R-U-N-A-R-G-I-A-N. Fun word. Thanks, Tolkien. Thank you, Tolkien. <laughs> Thanks, Tolkien. Some easier uh, names it's been known by. We've got uh, Dewaro Delph. There you go. That's pretty simple. Mm-hmm. The Black Chasm. Yeah, self-explanatory. The Black Pit. Even more so. Mansion of the Khazad. There you go. Which, you know, like Mansion of the Dwarves. Mansion of the Dwarves, sense. yeah, because that was just the Dwarves word for dwarf. Well, fuck it, you know? Most people, however, are familiar with another name. Moria. Oh, Moria. Which means the Black Pit. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this name was given to it after the dwarves awoke the Balrog deep in the mountains in 1980 of the Third Age. And this Balrog was given the name Durin's Bane after it killed King Durin the Sixth. Yep. Mm-hmm. Slew him. Slew him right away there. They tried to resist, but... To no avail. No avail. And Durin's son, Nain, was also later lost in the conflict, causing the dwarves to ultimately decide to leave Casa doom and abandon it because of all the evil shit that was going on there yeah. with that Belrog. And yeah, following these events, orcs would later move in and establish Moria as home to many tribes united under that dick... Azog the Defiler. Azog. Don't forget, Azog is a real character. Yes. And yeah, he's not the movie guy. He's not the movie guy. He's cooler. Cooler than that. He's cooler than the movie guy. He's way more metal than that. So jumping backwards in time, prior to these events, Casa Doom was arguably the greatest and most prosperous city Middle Earth has ever known. Yeah, it was. Absolutely. It's one of the oldest and one of the biggest. Yeah, dude, it was literally founded in the years of the trees, sometime between 1050 and 1300, but during the Deathless, that's during the first, right? Mm. The, in uh, the kingdom of Khazad-dûm survived the toils of Middle-earth for several millennia. Yeah, you remember they just, uh, like, even during the Second Age, remember, during war, or Elves of War and Sauron, they just like, close up. Boom. Yeah, just lock the doors. Yeah, just lock the doors. Yeah, nobody, <laughs> We're could, nobody could get in. <laughs> And there's a ton more history and information uh, to be had regarding the dwarves in Khazad Doom, uh, but uh, this is about enough just to set the stage for this game. Again, if you want a, more of that, you can go back and check out episode 71 for the Kingdom of Khazad Doom and episodes 29 and 30 for the dwarves. All right, we're going to get into the main story arc now Yeah. for the game. Return to Moria, that is. Just so you guys have an idea of kind of the story behind what's happening in this game. Yeah, and big, 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 big... Say it again. Big spoiler warning. Yeah, if you plan on playing this game, we're about to talk about everything that happens. Yes, so. skip ahead until it's done. <laughs> we're done talking about the story. If you, uh, I don't know how long that'll be. We'll the story see. is probably half the episode. Yeah, yeah, about half the episode. So yeah, if you don't want to hear it, just skip a little bit ahead. Listen to the end. The end will be cool. You'll like that. But yeah, we're gonna go through everything of the story here. Let's do it. So, just so everybody knows, the story, we're going to be going through it kind of as a first-person perspective, because sure. you play a dwarf, and you actually get to make this dwarf, so you kind of get to see it as you. A nameless, unnamed character. Well, I suppose you give them a name. Yeah, you give them a name, and uh, you can even just pick a random name, and they're all really cool. I actually went with a, with a random name, uh, Arismu or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, nice. Because, yeah, they all were really, really dwarfy. Arismu. I love that. Yeah. So when you do create your own dwarf, uh, there's several options for your character. Uh, but overall, it's, it's pretty simplified compared to some other games out there. Like you basically just pick a bunch of different preset like beards and hair, face shapes, um, and you can pick like colors and uh, you know like scars. Pretty simple that way. Um, but yeah, it's just ultimately a little library of preset looks to kind of just Lego together your character. Um, one of the things I found interesting about this game, and you mentioned this, that that was kind of unique, was that there's no like binary gender uh, for character creation. Right. 
Yeah, instead of uh, instead of having you just pick a gender, you have you a couple a- of a uh, couple of sliders, so you can yeah. um, you can either have your hips curve or not. You can make your shoulders smaller. You know, some of the faces look more feminine or masculine, just right. like, depending on which you'd prefer. And you do pick a voice, and it's just another list of voices. So they just kept it all, yeah, like yeah. nice, nice and ambiguous. Just yeah, it's just gender one, neutral. It's just one big pool of characteristics. It's not like you got a set of men characteristics and a set of female stuff. It's just one big pool, and you just choose what you want. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. At least one of our listeners, Flannel Bear, lo- <laughs> looking at you. I know you'll love that. So that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, I thought it was I thought it was really cool. And it, it kind of simplifies things uh like even further as I was saying like it's not a super in-depth character creator and and I like that. It like they don't have just a whole bunch of stuff. They keep it simple. Keep it real simple. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Yeah. Keep it secret, keep it safe. Keep it secret, keep it safe. So, once you're done creating yourself, you make your world and uh you get into the game and there is immediately a cutscene that you have between Gimli and some other dwarves and uh, me and Joel are going to go have a back and forth. Uh, I'll be voicing the emissary from Erebor. Joel will be Gimli. Gimli. Do it, gentlemen. Dwarves from every clan have answered your call, despite the king under the mountain's objection. Lord Gimli, Erebor will not support entering the Black Pit. If the king wants to stop us, he can come himself. Every attempt you've made has failed. This is a sign. No signs or kings are going to stop us. This is the time to reclaim Khazad Doom. Today, we get into that mountain. Is that blasting fire? This is madness. Gimli, you can't. We have to wait for Durin. Durin's not here. We have to do this ourselves. Maybe this will wake him up. Limin Barak, Limin Tagaz, Khazad Dashkin. The earth quakes beneath us. Lord Gimli, this is another sign. Oh, hammer and tongues, it's the fourth age. Nothing's going to stop us. I love that. It's the fourth age, nothing's going to stop us. It's like when you watch an old movie and they'll be like, come on, dude, it's the 90s already. <laughs> you know, and he's like, yeah. date yourself right away. I mean, Gimli looks pretty aged in the cutscene, for sure. He is supposed to be pretty old at that point. Yeah. He's getting towards the end of Gimli's life. Mm-hmm. It was cool seeing a, uh, a, a gray Gimli, basically. Heck yeah. So... After this uh, conversation takes place, your character and some other dwarves are placing some blasting barrels inside of a small cave to blow open an entrance because they were unable to get inside um, the doors of Durin. And uh, as the barrels are being set up, you see this sort of purple smoke that comes between them and through the cracks, and it actually sets off the explosives. You fall in, and you wake up inside the mountain, alone, Nick. with no way out. Oh, no. Now, it, it is uh, to be kept in mind... This uh, this game can be played with up to seven other people. Oh, really? That many? Yeah. That's wild. Um, so you can have uh, a whole bunch of friends, if you want, on this journey with you. But I am more or less treating this as a first-person uh, account, like I said earlier, because I'm one dwarf. Yeah. We should uh, hit us up on the Discord if you bought this game. Maybe we can get a group of uh, Tolkieners to play together or something. That'd, That'd be, be cool. Fun. Yeah. So uh, as you walk around trying to figure out how to get out, where to go, uh, you chance upon a raven of Erebor. His name is Arik, and uh, he offers to help search for a way out and for any survivors. And then he just kind of goes off. See you later, Arik. That's cool, because uh, we know from The Hobbit that like ravens and thrushes and stuff, at least in the Erebor region, are kind of like sentient, and they mm-hmm. take messages around and stuff. Yeah, yeah, this this bird super sentient. Yeah, you hold a whole conversation with it and everything. Which oh, is, sick, really? Which is pretty great. <laughs> That's pretty sick. Shortly after, you uh, come across the doors of Durin, because you, you fell inside pretty close. That's, you know, that's where you blew everything up. Mm-hmm. Uh, but inside the doors, you actually see that they're covered in that purple smoke that you saw come through the barrels. Ooh. And if you expose yourself to it, uh, it actually starts to give you some negative effects. What are uh, so, what, some of the negative effects? So... It gives you a debuff, so game talk. It gives you a debuff that debuff. Okay. Uh, is basically you just get cursed sure. while you're in it. And when you leave it, the curse slowly wears off, but the whole time you are losing health. Gotcha. Oh, it's kind of like being poisoned or something in, in a similar... It is, yeah. It's yeah. similar, um, except in this game, poison kills you faster. Faster than the curse? Yes. Sick, okay. It is decided that since the doors of Durin are sealed and you, you can't do anything, that the Dimmerald Gate is going to be the next best way to get out of Khazad Doom. Yeah, stands to reason. Gotta go all the way across, just like the Fellowship had to do. And we're going to refer to this purple smoke as the Shadow Curse. That is what the game calls it. Gotcha. Cool. Okay, so there's a mysterious Shadow Curse going on. 
And we've got to get our asses to the Dimrill Gate out east. Makes sense. Total sense. So, you begin to make your way. And while searching, of course, some supplies, because uh, you want to make camp, you know, you might be in here for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, you stumble upon a chest with the dwarf name Ori on it. Ori, Ori that's of our course. guy. Yeah, we know that guy. He's uh, one of the 13 dwarves uh, from The Hobbit. And he was also sent back to uh, help reclaim Moria, which is, I assume, how this chest got there, right, Trevor? Yeah, that's that's what we're thinking, right? Hell yeah. Yeah, Ori was one of the dwarves in Balin's company this time. Right. Yeah, Balin's company, we may remember came to moria and tried to reclaim it back in the third age and they all died they came to a fun end in the chamber of mazarble mazarble yeah Yeah, there we go yeah we'll we'll get on to the chamber of mazarble later too fuck yeah there's a lot of good lore in here hell yeah dude i'm so excited for this lore like everything i've told you like you've told me and like when we were reviewing this outline I, it seems super friggin' cool like if my if i had a computer that could run it i would buy it hell yeah it would be it would be a fun time yeah so this chest has a unique name. Yeah. So these chests, they're called Kafrun Akfur. It's a Kuz dual name that they came up with, original for this game. Yeah. And it's a near indestructible and impossible to open chest. And uh, you can't really move it or do anything with it. Only dwarves can open these. That's pretty cool. And interact with them. Yeah. And again, this concept of the Kafrun Akfur created for this game. Some pretty cool lore creating and Kuz dual used to make this. I appreciate it. So it's kind of like a dwarf version of like a biometric strong box. Yeah, it's a strong box. There you go. Yeah, in- interestingly enough, it actually uh, contains a recipe in the game, at least, to craft a key to open it. Each cool. one each one has its own unique uh, recipe. And there are five of them. And we're going to mention each time we find one because they are important. Because inside of them, you find journals or other things that are referencing a location in which you might find a piece of Durin's axe. Durin's axe. Yes, which is one of the things that um, they mentioned in the chamber in the um, the book of the Chamber of Mazarbo. They said yeah. something, something. Durin's axe. Remember, mm-hmm. they couldn't read it. Yep. So that is lore wise something in Moria is Durin's axe. Something, yeah, yeah. something in Moria. Split into five pieces. Uh, you find the first one in a nearby building, so we're pretty close to the chest. Um, and it was placed here long ago as a symbol of Durin's strength and to help ward against evil. Awesome. Which, uh, I mean, there's freaking orcs and wolves and shit just prowling the halls, so it's not doing a great job, if you ask me. He's not doing a good job. <laughs> but, so you next make your way through the inner areas near the doors of Durin. Uh, I believe this area is called Westgate. Cool. And uh, there's a bunch of abandoned structures. And eventually you takes you into the Elven Quarter, which is... Uh, I suppose, yeah, because the Westgate was right outside... The doors the, of Durin. That was uh, where the elves would come in. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. the elf entrance, yeah. Speak friend and enter friend. That makes sense. Uh, which we'll talk a little more about the Elven Quarter later as far as what it is, other than it just looking very elf-like and there are plants like actually growing in there with Ooh. giant uh, on the ceiling. There's big crystals um, with like a lattice design over top of them and they're providing light. Awesome. Which I have to I have to assume that is also True Quartz, which is a, a thing that I believe they made for this game as well. Okay. Mm-hmm. But again, more on that one later, just to give you an idea of what we're looking at. So they've got fancy dwarven grow lamps in there. That's pretty cool. <laughs> kind of, yeah. So now I understand this area is completely over- overrun by goblin men. Yeah, so there are a bunch of goblin men in there. Which we learned about in the orc episode. That's Check right. that out. So essentially, I mean, they're in here because the light doesn't really have an effect on them. Mm. Yeah. Right? You, go, you go deeper... Uh, and there are other orcs, and they orcs and goblin men do not get along. Uh, okay, okay. So yeah, they have to like have little camps uh, around in this area, and you also find a massive forge, the Great Forge of Narvi. Narvi, we know Narvi. Yeah, Narvi uh, is another named character we know. Yeah, yeah, BFF to Celebrimbor of uh, Aragian. Yeah, he was one of the greatest dwarven smiths of Khazad Doom in the Second Age. Yeah. Made the doors of Durin. Yep, helped make the yeah. doors of Durin. And uh, yeah, so this this concept of, of this forge of Narvi is, is unique to this game. But Narvi is a real person. This great forge created for this game. They did a lot of that. Yeah, but it's something that would totally make sense. That like there would yeah. be a super cool section of Moria just devoted to Narvi's workshop. Like, you know, that makes total sense. A lot of space under that mountain. Yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah so, there is. So why not? <laughs> yeah. So uh, you, find, you find this forge behind several of these goblin men. You can sneak around, I suppose, or, you know, just tear them up if you'd like. Sick. And you walk in and find the forge is broken. So... There's some pieces around the area. You you put together the forge so it's fixed and activate it. And uh, from there, you're able to 
craft better stuff. Which, Look. which that's the whole point of the forge, at least as far as the gameplay loop is concerned, is to advance you to the next section. So you're able to build a better pickaxe, and you can mine your way through a wall and move on. Got cool. It. Okay. So, and that's a that's a kind of re- common recurring thing. Is you know, it's a crafting game, so you're going to be trying to craft better stuff, and then that stuff gets you to the next thing, and then you do stuff, you craft more stuff, and yeah, that's more or le- more or less the simplified loop. You might say they're for the purpose of forging your way forward. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you went there, guys. No. That's how rich people laugh. <laughs> <laughs> the money makes you laugh that way. We're too poor to laugh. Equity. I don't even know what that means. That's how poor I am. I don't know what <laughs> equity means. I like they always those commercials on TV that are always like, increase your home equity. I'm like, I don't know. I failed economics. I don't know what that means. Um, what, Kitty? What did you say? I write, just... <laughs> I write goofy Tolkien sketches. That's what I do. I don't, you know. <laughs> well, from the Elven Quarter, you uh, right on the other side is the actual mines of Moria. The mines. You fear to go into those mines. Yeah. Despite this game being called Return to Moria, the actual area called Moria is uh, a relatively small part compared to the rest. Oh. The mines, anyway. The, the mines, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, just the mining section. Oh, yeah, yeah, that would make sense, yeah. Yeah, and it is a section that, like, if you watch the movies or whatever, I feel like they did uh, a good job kind of making you feel like it, it could be part of the same world. Yeah, and it's, mm-hmm. it's there's the, the famous scene in the extended edition when uh, Gandalf says, Moria's wealth was not in gold or jewels, but Mithril. And then he puts the staff over the side, and you can see the veins of Mithril on the... Yeah, super cool. Very, very vertical. Yes, there's a lot very of verticality. Yeah. Very ver- for being underground, there's a lot of vertical shit. Yeah. Yeah, the Moria area is actually the first area walking into where you do have a lot of vertical space. Mm. Okay. Um, which, I mean, does give it some extra size. It's just how much of it is actually useful, but that's a different thing. So in the mines of Moria, you learn of a place called Orc Town from some orcs <laughs> that are just roaming around. You know, they're just kind of blabbing on about stuff. Mm-hmm. And in... The Mines of Moria, you also find the second Kafrun Akfer. Uh, and this one was left by Loni. The Dwarf Loni. Also, uh, this is uh, unique to this game, the Dwarf Loni. Still, the Loni is supposed to be one of Balin's. Of Balin's I thought Loni uh, was mentioned. Isn't he one of the ones that got killed by the Watcher? Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Let me check. Okay, yes. So, Loni is a real dwarf. I got that wrong. Yeah, part of sick. Balin's one of one of the other dwarves, part of Balin's crew. Balin's but uh, crew. Orc Town itself, that concept is unique to this game. Right, Orc Town, um, Goblin Town is real, but Orc Town, right, never heard of it. Mm-hmm. But you know, that's cool. It sounds very plausible. Yeah, if there's a Goblin Town, there's got to be an Orc Town, right? The interesting thing is, it's not much of a town. Oh, it it is kind of it's like some caves where uh, it has some like orc like architecture you know stuff made of bones and shit architecture architecture <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh there's even a like a little prison that they have and then there's a big room where you fight a boss guy okay cool and uh, so in the confronac for you actually uh it points to a an, an orc uh named bulgok having the uh, next piece of the axe of durin and as I understand from what you explained to me, Bolgok is supposed to be the last in the line of Azog the Defiler, correct? Yeah, yeah. He uh, is a unique character to this game. But. Yeah, because mm-hmm. we do, and we we know that Azog does have a line because Bolg is his son who fought in the mm-hmm. Battle of the Five Armies, correct? Yep. Yeah. 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 But so, Bolg also died in the Battle of Five Armies. But maybe he had a son at home? Yeah, this mm-hmm. game is this game is making that assumption. Yes. Yeah, dude. And I yeah, I very much like that. I like that it's like let's uh, let's relate this character to a real character, mm-hmm. and uh, it, it, honestly, it makes it more believable, which is great. So Bolgok, son of Bolg, son of Azog. After laying rest to the line of Azog, you take the second piece of Durin's axe. <laughs> After just dealing with that that lineage. <laughs> <laughs> gotta, end, gotta end that line. Gotta end that brood for yeah. once and for all. I think it's great. As like um as bad as as Azog was, like his uh I don't know grandson, I guess yeah. is, is your yeah. first boss, and it's like we're just gonna cut off your family line. See you later. Yeah. See ya. <laughs> end of that. And after you do that, you learn from another meeting you have with Arik um, that all the paths leading to the upper levels are blocked by the Shadow Curse. And Arik is the Raven the from Raven er- from Erebor. Erebor, mm-hmm. correct? Cool. And uh, so with uh, limited other options, you decide to try to find the fabled Pilgrim Road. Okay. 
and this road should lead you to the eastern stairs and up to the bridge of Khazad Doom. Oh, this is the area that I thought was really cool, the Crystal Depths. Yes, yeah. The Crystal Depths is, uh, you chance upon it as you're going through the caves. And since you can't go up, you might as well go down. Yeah, and where are you going to go? Yeah, go down. Where, where else are you going to go? You don't, yeah, you're not, gonna, you're not just going to go sideways. You can't always do that. So you uh, you descend the crystal depths. Uh, the whole area is lit by by the true quartz, which is a, a form of quartz that just always glows. Yeah, it's Very got cool. it captures light somehow. I wonder if it's a work of the Noldor because they can do that. I would say it's probably not. Oh, you don't think so? No, I don't think so because think so? Uh, the dwarves are actually known for having crystal lamps. Oh, but that's, uh, their, that's their thing. Are they friends with the Noldor right outside the door? No. No. <laughs> 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 he didn't think yes. about that. He yes. like looks at me. He's like, "Shit." Yes, they were for a short point, at p- p- short amount yeah. of time. No, but those be. crystal lamps were around before they were okay, friends cool, with Okay, cool, cool. I did. I did not know that, sir. Yes, did no, not they, yeah. know that. that. That is something that's original to Durin the First. Sick. Okay, cool. With the lamps of Durin. Mm-hmm. We'll go over that later too. Actually. Awesome. Um, <laughs> you caught me for that. I was like, wait, uh, wait. Ah. Uh. That was fun. That was a uh, a battle of Tolkieneering there. Sometimes it a comes a Tolkieneering yeah, battle. Tolkieneering <laughs> battle. <laughs> so the crystal depths, this pilgrim road, and the lower deeps. All these, all of these areas and these concepts are also new and unique to this game. Yeah, but like totally not out of the realm. Of no, like, not out of the realm. Of so what could be cool, you know? When we were going through this, we were reviewing this episode, and all these little things. I had to start going through and making notes, like what is unique to this game and what is not, because mm-hmm. there are so many things, so many little lores that they created for this game that were, just totally fit too. That fit so well, I couldn't tell if it was just something I didn't know, yeah, or what. Uh, so I had to look up all these. I was like, wait, wait, that's, the pilgrim, the pilgrim road. I got to look that up. Is that a real thing? That's good lore building. That's not how you not know. in the text, but in this game, yeah, mm-hmm. it's believable. Which it's believable. very yeah. believable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's exactly why I had to get both of you onto the game to pull you out of your busy schedules for yeah, at least an yeah. hour because <laughs> I wasn't check sure. It out. Yeah. Likewise, like the uh, the true crystal lamps. There's no such thing as uh, true quartz. True quartz, yeah. But there is such thing as true silver. Yes. Mithril. Mithril. They yeah. call it true silver. Mm-hmm. Um, so it would make sense that there might be something else called true quartz. I really liked that. Yeah. Well, after you make your way through the true quartz area of the crystal depths, you find yourself on the pilgrim road, uh, which despite the name is not a road at all. Uh, they're actually like some caverns with um, a lot of poisonous mushrooms and shit. Okay. Oh. And as you're going through them, you find another great forge, but it is flooded. Oh, so no. so you, you can't actually continue. So looking around to see what you can do about it, you find a large underground lake, which, you know, being in Khazad Dooms, a pretty cool sight to see, really. Mm-hmm. And on the other side of it, some giant drain pipes. You know who would love that underground lake? <laughs> Maybe that's his summer home. Wouldn't that be funny? His summer home. He got him in his summer home. Ah, that explains why he was in Moria when the Fellowship came through. Right, yeah. He was just vacationing in his summer home. <laughs> he was vacationing, yeah. Well, this uh, this particular lake was big enough to house the Watcher in the water. Right. Ooh. Somehow. That's like, it must be like Godzilla, like the hollow earth thing, where it can like get from one part of the planet to the other, like through underground water tunnels. It must. So I'm actually, I'm pretty sure that the way this game does it is that there is more than one. Oh. oh. I don't it's think like it's a, the same one that which is outside the door. It's a species. Which to the lore, is to the lore because it says in the Fellowship of the Ring that they did not know if it were, was one or many things, mm-hmm. you know? All they saw were many tentacles. Many tentacles. Yeah. After you beat the shit out of this thing, because you, you, yeah. you do fight it and uh, take it out. Uh, I took it out with a crossbow, personally. That was pretty cool. Cool. You uh, go across, much like the previous Great Forge, you repair the drain pumps, you activate them, and you make your way back to the forge. Now, unflooded. Okay. And upon examining this forge and repairing it, you have to repair everything, I swear. Uh, it allows you to make newer tools again, and this forge is titled the Great Forge of Belagost. Ah, another great forge named after a real place. Yeah, a real place. that. Uh, <laughs> for those of you that don't remember, Belagost is a... Uh, Dwarven city in the Blue Mountains in yeah. the uh, well, year. It goes all the way back to the years of the trees, but it's mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it's in the Blue Mountains. Most um, prominent during the first stage. During it, the first stage, correct. Yeah. Belagos had its uh, like sister city of Nagrod. There was Nagrod. there were the two Dwarven 
settlements of Belagost and Nagrod. So yeah. another cool throwback to a real thing. Yeah, Belagost is where uh, uh, the, 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 what's his name, Telkar was from, right? Or was he from Nagrod? See, I always get the two mixed. It might have been Azagal. Azagal was from Belagost. I'm pretty sure. Yep, Azagal. Well, fun that you mentioned these two houses of dwarves. Because we're in the deeps, and this game explains the deeps as a place where uh, both the Belagost and the Nagrod refugees were. Oh, oh my god, that's really cool. That's so cool that's because a, that's we, the part they lived in. We literally in the Kazadum episode talk about when they took all the refugees from from the first age in, yep. and it became like a, a dwarven like renaissance for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. So. Continuing on past the forge, you come upon a place called the Tomb of Kings, uh, which is a, basically it's just a big tomb that tombs the great kings of khazad specifically the six Durins. Yeah, you gotta have them all. You gotta, <laughs> gotta, gotta, gotta catch, catch them all. all. Yeah. <laughs> Except for one, because he hasn't woken he's, yet. Yeah, he's not back yet. So this, uh, this tomb is found along the Pilgrim Road of the Lower Deeps, and there's also an altar here that is designed specifically to hold something called the Khazad Stone. Ooh, the Khazad Ooh, Stone, you say. Dwarf Stone. Yeah. Oh, okay, we will talk okay. more about the Khazad Stone later. Keep that little nugget in the back of your mind. Okay, okay. Heck yeah. The Khazad Stone is also unique to this game. So, a nice, nice cool addition. Next, you get to something that is actually uh, in canon. Mm-hmm. The uh, you go past the tombs and you find the eastern stairs. The eastern stairs. However, they are damaged. Can we think of maybe some event that may have damaged the eastern Gee, stairs? I, I wonder what it could have been. I wonder. Almost like a Balrog and a wizard came through. Yeah, it's almost like two Maiar beat the shit out of each other for five days or whatever the fuck over there. So in order to continue up the stairs, as everything else, you must repair them. Uh, and your tools aren't strong enough. Ooh. Yeah. So it's like, all right, cool. You need to find knowledge to make better tools. So you go exploring about, and you find something called the Pilgrim Library, also known as the Library of Kibil Nala. And the Library of Kibil Nala, the library is a is a unique concept to this game, but Kibil Nala is actually a dwarvish name for the river that runs east of the Misty Mountains through Lorien. So a lot of people might know this as the liver, uh, the liver. The, a lot of people might know this as the River Celebrant or the Silver Load. Right, and Celebrant, I think, just means, because Caleb means silver in, uh, in Cinderin, so mm-hmm. Celebrant must just mean silver load. Yeah, so it's just that small river just yeah. outside the eastern gate that they follow down into, that the fellowship follows down into Lorien. So the Library of Kibil Nala, not a real thing, but again, based on a real, named after a real thing. Real thing, yeah. It's like, you know, how Riverview Library on the west side, shout out, where I used to go, you know, <laughs> it's by the river. Call it that. Interesting uh, bit about the library is uh, in the in the in-game lore, it states something about how like dwarves would come here to like learn knowledge, but first they would leave knowledge. Mm. Oh, interesting. And with all that knowledge, you uh, learn how to forge a new metal, uh, Shanor Alloy, Ooh. which uh, it describes as an ancient lost technique and is also unique to this game. Some more cool lore building. Good job. Good job. So with your newfound knowledge and techniques, you craft up some better nifty tools and you repair the eastern stairs. And somewhere in this journey for the Pilgrim Library, you actually chance upon another one of those Kafrun Akfur. Uh, and this one belongs to Owen. O- Owen? Owen? Owen. Owen. Yeah, he was also uh, in the 13 Dwarves. Yeah. Owen, oh. Owen uh, brother to Gloin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay, so he also made it to Bolin's company. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, there are a handful of dwarves from uh, the original Hobbit, Thorn and Company. That yeah, they end w- up in Balin's company to go. Retake yeah, Moria. Apparently, they're e- the most epic journey ever, culminating in a huge fucking battle. Wasn't enough adventure for a lifetime, right? <laughs> for, these, yeah. Yeah. for these dwarves, and they were like, "Let's go reclaim another lost kingdom." We, we did got, it once. We can do it again. Yeah, yeah. Inside of this chest, you learn of the. There's another document or whatever stating that there's a troll in possession of the third piece of Durin's axe. Shit. Um, this is just kind of like randomly off the side path if you're exploring around and you can just waltz in and take it. You leave the troll alone. Like he didn't even see me when I walked in and grabbed this one. He had a whole cave to himself and I'm just like, mine, walk away. <laughs> Seems like a little bit of an oversight, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, I should have just fought it. The combat in this game is not terribly hard. Uh, and if you, if you, if you're a, a, you know, if you're a Souls player like I am, you'd kind of just see their moves and you're like, okay, I can just dodge everything. No problem. Yeah. And- well, yeah. If you're, if you're a Souls player, then you're just. Better at playing a lot of games than most people. That that game teaches you how to fucking 
parry and counter and block like nobody's business. Like that's what it's all about. It teaches you patience. So I, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and speak for the layman here. They're referring to the Dark Souls series. Dark Souls, uh, Demon Souls, Demon Souls, uh, Elden Ring, Bloodborne, Bloodborne. Bloodborne. Yeah. And, 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 what game and company is that again? That's from Software. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I know you're a big fan of that That's company. Love, love it. I remember you straight up went and bought PS4 for Bloodborne, didn't you? Yes. I remember that. I remember you coming home with like a, a big box and the fucking PlayStation 4. And you know, I was like, why did you just pick that up? You're like, Bloodborne, dude. Yeah. I gotta play Bloodborne. Gotta play Bloodborne. Like I was stupid, you know, like <laughs> dumbass. Uh, Bloodborne, duh. yeah. Yeah. All great games and all the spinoffs are known as Soulsborne. That's what, Sick. Of, you know, Dark Souls oh, and Bloodborne gotcha, together. Okay. Gotcha. So if you've ever seen that on the internet somewhere, that's what they're referring to. Oh, okay. Or Souls like. Anyway, I digress. Moving <laughs> on. <laughs> Enough gamer talk. <laughs> Enough gamer talk. We're talking about a video game. We're we don't have time about, for yeah. games. We don't have time for gamer talk. Yeah. yeah. Nerd. Nerd. Upon ascending the Easter stairs after you have repaired them, you find yourself upon the bridge of Khazadum, still broken from the encounter between Gandalf and Durinsbane. Of cool, course. Cool. It is also here that you encounter a dragon by the name Shazone. Shazone. Like Michael Jackson? Shazone. Shazone. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a uh, full name is Narag Shazon, but Narag Shazon. <laughs> the dragon is the one responsible for spreading the shadow curse throughout Khazad Doom. However, Shazon is not the source of the curse. Oh, but the dragon does spread it. And as far as uh, it looks, the dragon is covered in it. Uh, oh, so the dragon okay. has likely also been shadow cursed. I Interesting. See. Okay. Okay. So it it threatens you and it flies off. I know you're inside of a big cave, but it, it it's flying around. No problem. <laughs> it flies away. No problem. Don't worry about it. It's a big dragon too. It's not. It's not small. Like <laughs> it can get lift in there. Yeah, it could swallow you whole. Like yeah. no problem. It's a big dragon. Mm. So you look across, you know, where the bridge was, and you have to repair it, so you can make your way to the, the Dimmerel Gate because it's right on the other side. But you also notice uh, on the other side there's a shadow curse infected stone gate covering the path. So even if you could repair the bridge or somehow build your way over, because you can build stuff in this game. Mm-hmm. You're not getting through it. You can't do anything with those doors yet. Damn. Yet. Yet. Keyword. Let me get appearance from our bird friend again. Yep. Arik comes back, and he's made contact with King Thord from outside. So the bird found a way out. Doesn't okay. doesn't tell you, as far as I know, what that is. Um, I'm guessing a hole in the ceiling somewhere. <laughs> I, I don't know. Whatever it is, it's for the fucking birds. You yeah, know it's what for I mean? the bird, right? I couldn't fit through it, I guess. For the bird. And uh, King Thorin has tasked you with finding the Khazad Stone, a.k.a. the Stone of the Dwarves. Ah, uh, yes, this Khazad Stone. It comes up again. Yeah. It's a chunk of Mithril, and it's the first stone mined by Durin the Deathless. We have a excerpt here from the game, Return to Moria, uh, and this is going to be read by Danny. The first stone mined and carved by Durin, the first of our fathers to awake. By Aule's design, the Khazad Stone called him to the Miromare. To carve his halls beneath these mountains. Here it shall remain, passed down his line, for only then will Durin awake again from sleep. For it is his duty, his honor, and strength to lead his people and keep the shadows at bay. The Khazad Stone. Khazad Stone. I actually really, really like the concept of the Khazad Stone. It's definitely something. 100% believable. It's like yeah. it's unique to this game, but I mm -hmm. it makes total sense. Like right. it's not it's not even close to the edge of the box. Like it's mm -hmm. in it. Yeah, dude. Into just name dropping Aule. They're saying by Aule's design the yeah. stone yeah, is like Yeah, they even this. name drop Aule. They even name drop and Aule. They, and they even use this the call of this stone as an explanation for how Durin the first came across the mirror mirror for the first time and how he became inspired to carve his halls beneath right Kaza, and, and make Kaza doom so totally that's pretty cool. cool that's pretty cool. totally fucking cool the only thing that would have been cooler is if they would have said by mahal's design mm. the name that the dwarves use for aule is mm -hmm. that a is that a kuzadul name yes yes mahal mahal, mahal. It's, uh, I also like how they tie the Khazad Stone into the, what would you call it, the legend uh, or, or prophecy of Durin, of the seven Durins. Oh, right. Sure. Okay. Cause, right. Because it specifically says, it like, the, the stone needs to remain here for only then will Durin awake from sleep. So, mm -hmm. like, it has mm -hmm. some... They did tie it in there. I some, see what you some mean. Some tie-in mm -hmm. to Durin. Like, like when he, when Durin the Deathless died, quote, <laughs> quotes, right? I right. love that. <laughs> when Durin the Deathless, you know, when he fucking died. When he died. <laughs> he did die. That's a funny sentence. Uh, that is a funny sentence. You could maybe think that the uh, Khazad Stone maybe houses his uh, his spirit, his Feya. Oh, okay. And mm. so when he is resurrected, it leaves the stone and in, into the body of the new Durin. 
Oh. Interesting. So, I mean, that's kind of my own thought. That's my own token earring. It doesn't say that specifically. Nice job. Uh, okay. But but okay. it does kind of allude to that could be a possibility. God damn, Trevor. Wow. It, it makes it Yeah, makes, I mean, sad. that's sort of the concept behind the one ring. Trevor, I love you more power. every day. Did you know that? Well, you're gonna you're gonna continue loving me throughout this episode. Ooh, yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so then, your next move is to make your way to the chamber of Mazarbul. Mazarbul, Mazarbul, and in the cham well, not in the chamber of Mazarbul. On your way up, because you go through some like more lots of stairs and other structures and things. A lot of walking. A lot of walking. Some orc killing. You know, mm. collect some kuzdu oats on your way if you want. <laughs> kuzdu oats. Kuzdu oats. <laughs> and uh, you find another coffer in Akfor. Uh, this one belonging to Flowey or Flowey. Well, how would you say that? I think it's Flowey. 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 And we learn from this uh, coffer in Akfor via another document that the next piece of Durin's axe is probably in in Dwardelf, but uh, the area is overrun by orcs, so they were unable to uh, get it. Yeah, we okay. saw that in the movie. Remember, Dwarodelf was where all the fucking orcs came out of the there ceiling were, and yeah, shit. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Bugs and shit. <laughs> yeah. The movie played that really cool, the way they crawled out of cracks like yeah. bugs. Yeah, it was super cool. You then make your way into the Chamber of Mazarbal proper, and you find some records regarding the Kazit Stone. Uh, okay. These, this is specifically, uh, I believe, um, in that the Book of Mazarbal. I think you mentioned, or the same, yeah. the same one that Gandalf picks up, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, like uh, their their diary, essentially. Their journal or something. Yeah, their yeah. journal, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm pretty sure it's that exact document. Okay. And it's stated in here that Durin the Sixth would have kept the Kazan Stone close and likely would have had it with him at the Great Forge during the fall. Mm. Okay. Okay, okay. So, shortly. Some hints. Some hints, some hints right? Shortly after this, you come across another Kafranakfer, this one belonging to Balin himself. Our Balin. boy. Our boy Balin. And this is the last one you five. We're at, we're at, we're at you five. You find, because we're at five. That's what I was trying to get at. Five. Five. So this fine. is the last of the Kafrun Akfor chests. Yes. Inside this one, you find records of an outpost in the desolation of Durin's Bane. What? Yeah, this is, uh, this is an area that, well, Durin's Bane absolutely wrecked. Sure. And it is nearby to the Great Forge of Durin, which is also the seat of Durin. Very cool. Where of his, course. Uh, where his throne is, right? Of course. Uh, dwarves would have their fucking throne near their forge. Hell you know yeah. what I mean? Of course they would. Totally dwarf shit. Hell yeah. Okay. I love that. I love that. I... I, I I want to high five whoever did the fucking lore on this game. Like we we need to have a beer with these people. Uh, I believe uh, we mentioned his name is David Salo. David Salo, the guy with the virtual with the high five, name. dude. If you ever hear this, like yeah, virtual high five. Yes. So both of these concepts, the desolation of Durin's Bane and the Great Forge of Durin, are both unique to this game. Mm-hmm. And these are both areas that are inside Dwarf Elf. Actually, oh, specifically, oh. The so like there's specific parts of Dwarf of Dwarf Elf. Hmm. Okay, at least that's how I pieced it together because everything kind of connects, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you are expecting the final axe piece to be somewhere in the desolation of Durin's Bane or or at the Great Forge. Okay. So you make your way through past the Chamber of Mazarbal and you find yourself in Dwarf Elf because that's where you got to go next. Of course. You find it's overrun with orcs, wolves, and even some trolls and drakes. Cool. <laughs> Oh shit! Yeah, we're getting we're getting into the real big evil, other than you know the dragon. Sure. And uh, so you know you walk through, you fight a bunch of stuff, you take out a troll or two, and you find the fourth piece of the axe in some old structures. And uh, passing just past this area, you then find yourself in the desolation, as we just mentioned. Mm-hmm. And here you encounter Shazone again, the dragon. The dragon. She taunts you and uh, flies off, leaving the area with dangerous drakes uh, to take care of you. She's like, you're not worth my time. Have some of my kids, basically. (laughs) (laughs) You're some of my underlings. Underlings, yeah. And uh, specifically, drakes uh, in this game, they're not, uh, they don't have wings and they're basically like little small dragons. Mm-hmm. We learned that in the uh, in the, uh, the the dragons episode, right? True, but a drake could have wings. I guess is what I'm getting at. These ones specifically do not. Oh, gotcha. That's right. And that's because there's another variant of them called the fell beast. And we'll note that later, but the fell beast is basically a drake with wings. Oh, okay. So moving throughout the desolation of Durin's Bane, you eventually come across... I was wrong. There is another Kafrunakfur. Oh, 
And uh, Farrar has left this one behind. Farrar. Another, another one of uh, Ballin's. Ballin's company. Mm-hmm. Fun little side story on this one. Uh, I was doing research on the game, right? Playing mm-hmm. the game. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had logged out an area that was not my home base. Well, I didn't realize that, and I left my lore tabs up, and eventually, if you don't eat something, you die. Mm-hmm. So I died, and I had to go... <laughs> I spawned somewhere else in the map, and I had to make my way back to this spot. And, like, I had already beaten the game by this point. I didn't think there was anything left to find. Bam. I found this coffer knock fur just on accident. That's super <laughs> funny. You totally... Yeah, which is why you spaced it on the... on the. Which is why it yeah. got a little bit spaced, and it was like, oh, right, because I found that later. Yeah. That's super funny. And uh, inside this one, you do find another piece of information about the axe. Uh, and Ballin is stating that they actually had found this piece them- themselves. Like, they hadn't found the other pieces or gotten them as far as their letters were concerned. But this one they did find. But they were unable to remove it from the masonry without alerting other, like, the, the evil that is still in Moria at this mm. time. Mm. And uh, so you then take out some of the local orc outposts. And uh, in one of them, you find the final, you find another piece of Durin's axe. Shit, Yeah. And now you can reforge the axe because you have all five. You've got all five pieces now. Yes. Durin's yes. axe. But you actually can't make it yet because you have to forge it at the Great Forge of Durin. Fuck. His axe can only be repaired and made whole again at his own forge. Mm, makes Over sense. by his throne, right? Over by his throne, yeah. So you make your way there. You already know where it is. You know you would have passed it by now if you were walking around. And uh, inside, you encounter a large troll. Who claims to be king, and he's wearing Durin's crown. Ooh. Okay. While sitting on Durin's throne. Ooh, any dwarf would find that outrageously insulting. Oh, yeah. They'd tear at their beards. They would tear their beards and wail. <laughs> yeah, he was, I mean, he was big, uh, but he's, you know, being a troll, he's really dumb. Of and course. S- and so, like, all you had to do was, like, he'd, he'd rush you, you just move, and he hits a wall, and you just go hit him. Oh, cool. <laughs> he, like, crashes into the wall, and you get some time to just hit him, so he just says that over and over again. Uh, so he's no match for you. Does he get environment damage every time he hits the wall? Uh, he breaks shit, but no. Ah, damn, that would be no. really funny if he, he just, was just fucking himself up on the wall. <laughs> you just poke him with a spear bunch. Or at ah, least that's what I did. Cool. Uh, and so, now that he's dead, you take the crown off of his disrespectful ass head. Nice. <laughs> his disrespectful Good. head. And, uh, there's actually a statue nearby. Uh, you put the crown on top of it and you repair the statue and it's, you know, a little monument to Durin. Oh, fun, okay. Then you teabag the body a few times and... yeah. A few more times. You would have done this a couple times. Oh, sure. Okay. You're right. You're right. Lots of uh, dwarves like tea, right? Right? Dwarves like tea. Do they? Um, I doubt it. I doubt dwarves even know what tea is. Well, I mean, dwarves are into like trading a lot of stuff. So like tea is a commodity. They might they might dig it. I guess maybe they try yeah, it. Yeah. Like like they try like probably pipe weed or something. Yeah. Yeah. They hang out in the Shire and in Bree, you know, like, they, you know. They're dwarves are cultured. You're right. They probably yeah. know. They probably have tea. Yeah, because at this at the uh, toward the end of the third age, the dwarves, especially the dwarves of uh, Khazadum and Erebor, were just kind of a wandering people. They didn't really have a home. They were doing like uh, you know odd jobs and stuff like that. I was just reading The Hobbit last night, and they did. They talked about how they did like odd blacksmithing jobs and stuff like that to mm-hmm. survive. Well, I yeah. suppose. Yeah, who are you gonna hire? They yeah. would also often travel, frequently travel from the Blue Mountains in the west out to the whatever settlements in the east. You know, Iron Hills. Mm-hmm. And the, and the Arab War and whatnot. Yeah, because uh, the well, they traveled a lot. Yeah, there were still active mines in the Blue Mountains at that time. I mm-hmm. I think it's cool that you actually bring that up because in the character creation, one of the little fun flavor things you can do is choose which like tribe of dwarf you had belonged to. Mm-hmm. Oh, cool! So like the Blue Mountains were one, uh, Red Mountains were another. Bella Belagrost. 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 Yeah, was uh, I believe another one. You could be a dwarf of Norgrad. Nogrod, yeah, they yeah they yeah. had they had a bunch of them, which was super cool. And I mean, it wasn't important on anything that you did, but it, it helped to make your dwarf you know fit more in with the lore, which it's is pretty just great. All lore, man, and I yeah. I love that about this game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this game did a exceptional job with their lore. Hell yeah! So finally, now that you've taken the forge back, you can reforge Duran's axe, and upon doing so, you are now capable of breaking down those big gates that have the shadow curse on them oh uh, now you can break the shadow curse yeah now you can break it and fun little thing so you can go all the way back to the doors of durin if you want to and you can hack at them with this axe a little bit and by the way we say axe it's a pickaxe everybody durin's oh, axe yeah. is a pickaxe that was the twist that's it's, the twist yo, everyone thought it was a battle axe but it was actually a pickaxe this is the biggest uh, relic related twists since uh, <laughs> the, the the last crusade with the cup of Christ. Oh yeah, the uh, 
they think it's going to be <laughs> like this holy ornate grail. yeah the holy grail and then he's like and then indy's smart and he goes that's the cup of a carpenter and it's just a simple wooden cup and he was fucking right yeah that's that's, that's what it reminded me of chosen why you have chosen it is wisely. it is not what anybody thought it was yeah Cool. Yeah, when when you uh, told me about that, I thought that was a cool twist that Duran's axe would be a, a pickaxe. Because yeah, when you think about not, it, they're not lying. Way back in Duran's day, it was all about building and forging mm-hmm. things. There wasn't a lot of like battle happening. This is when Khazad Doom was prosperous. Yeah. So that it's makes the, a lot of sense. The to glory me. days, mm-hmm. as it were. Mm-hmm. If you do take that pickaxe to the doors of Duran to break the Shadow Curse, uh, it works. Which is great. Oh. I mean, that, however, as far as the story is concerned, you're, you you won't let you leave. Okay. Because you are you have to take out the dragon. Oh, of course. Uh. And uh, you you actually learn about this right right next, like right after you're done forging the axe, before you would even have a chance to go back to the doors. Or it comes back, and he tells you that King Thorin has tasked you with killing the dragon, and he provides you with information regarding the location of a mithril forge and the plans to craft a weapon called the Shaz Achnaman. Shazaknaman. Ooh. That's a fun word. Shazaknaman. Sounds very Kuzdul. Yeah. Reminds me of ancient Egyptian. Which I guess kind of. You know what I mean, man? Doesn't that sound like an ancient... Tutankhamun. Yeah, like an ancient <laughs> Egyptian uh, pharaoh or something? The pyramid of Shazaknaman. Yeah, Shazaknaman. <laughs> this uh, spear made of mithril should be powerful enough to take on a dragon. Very cool, very cool. Do it up. I, I was kind of disappointed that you end up having to fight the dragon with a spear because, uh, you know... An axe would be way cooler since yeah. you, Durin's axe wasn't an axe. Yeah. But it's fine. Yeah, axe, I don't know. Whenever I think of fighting dragons, I think of axes. I don't yeah. think, I feel like swords wouldn't quite cut it. And we know arrows don't quite do it unless you've got the black arrow yeah. I mean, hit him in the right empty spot. But spear's a good weapon to do it. But like, are good. you know, I, I think a dwarf, yeah, would probably do an axe. I mean, well, we, you we know talked what they about would, it in the dragons episode. You know what they might do is what's that thing called a halbard? The the pole axe. Oh, a halberd, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, a halberd, right? Yeah. What, why wouldn't they use that? That'd be good. Pole axe. Because they, they got a pointy end, too. Mm-hmm. Either way. Well, they, <laughs> Either way. Pole axes, I mean, those things are arguably some of the best medieval weapons because you have slashing and piercing and you have reach with it. Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're very sharp. Like It is, it a, is an underrated like, weapon. It is a multi-useful weapon of death. Mm-hmm. It's great. Yeah, super cool. So you make your ways back to the earlier areas of Casa Doom, all the way back to Westgate, and you break down uh, one of those stone uh, shadow cursed uh, gates that you could have come across earlier, but you wouldn't have been able to proceed without Duran's axe. And now that you can, you come across the the crossroads. Oh, like from the Fellowship. Yes, uh, actually, I'm pretty sure it's supposed oh, to be that exact crossroads. Where with Gandalf the, can't th- remember uh, where to go. With the three doors. Yeah. yeah, and the fork it splits in three directions. The left road is marked with a rune that was left by Gandalf, warning you of evil. Mm-hmm. And taking this path leads you to uh, Karatras, or the area that is known as Karatras. We know the mountain is called Karatras. Mm-hmm. Right. The center road leads to a dead end, um, but I'm pretty sure it, it leads to... Uh, there's um, the st- I think it leads to the stairs of Xerix Eagle. Oh, the endless stair. The endless stair. Hell yeah. Mm, that would be why it's blocked off. Yeah. And uh, it's blocked off and you, you can never get through it. Mm. The right road, if you were to take it, takes you back to Dwaro Delph. Now, you could have also made your way to this place from Dwaro Delph. Uh, the areas are interconnected somewhat. Okay. 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 Cool. While journeying through Karatras, because that is the direction you need to go, you discover this great Mithril Forge, and right beside it, you find Nain's grave. Oh, Nain. Nain, king uh, killed by the the uh, the son of Durin the sixth. Son of Durin the Sixth. You got it. You got it. Uh, and he was killed by the Balrog. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He was killed here, yes. And laid beside his grave are a few journals detailing his last stand. And buried with him, you find the Khazad Stone. The Khazad Stone. Yeah. All right. I suppose it makes sense that it went. It got buried with the last king of Khazad Doom. Yeah. Total sense. Indeed. Continuing on, you eventually find some more paths leading into uh, further into the deeps, which the deeps has kind of two meanings. You have the lower deeps, which is that whole area with the Pilgrim's Road and everything that we talked about. Mm-hmm. And then there are other smaller uh, areas called the deeps that are, uh, it's, it's basically just like a dead end, right? You're, like, you're digging in, there's some caves, but they all result in dead ends. Uh, this area, it puts you in like a sort of like perpetual darkness. It, you, it is bright enough. You can see everything, but your torches do not provide you um, with a healthy kind of light. And so... In this game, if you were in darkness for too long, you eventually get a debuff called Despair. 
Oh. And despair hurts you. Uh, yes, it does. Yeah. yeah, maybe, yeah. So Everybody it, hurts some. It's a, <laughs> It whittles away your health, so you can only be down here for so long. But in these places are also where you find, like, the rare minerals. Like, you'll find precious gems and stuff in some of the earlier areas. But in Karadharas, you find mithril. Thick. So you gather yourself a bunch of mithril. I gathered way too much mithril. There is not enough stuff in this game to craft <laughs> with the amount of mithril I, I grabbed. Oh, really? I wanted it all. That's so funny. And using Thorin's plans, you create the Shazaknaman. And you make your way to the Dragon's Horde. There's actually a door that you can't get through until you have the spear. So once you have the spear, you walk in and you're going to go fight Shazone. Fight the dragon. Shazone. Making your way to this Dragon's Horde, you actually discover the fabled Well of Shadow. And the Well of Shadow is a place where Morgoth's very essence leaks into the world. Word. And they mentioned Morgoth by name. They name drop Morgoth. Wow. The only time I remember seeing it, but they name drop Morgoth. Major fucking cool points. Yeah. Morgoth, Melkor, that's a character whose name I did not expect to come up anywhere in this game. No. But the fact that they included it and that there's this... The lore is so complete that they mentioned yeah, that. Yeah, and they even came up with this little fabled well of shadow where like Morgoth's evil essence leaks out into the world. I really like that. Really cool. I thought that was a really cool like lore expansion. Heck yeah. And you made, uh, talked about it, Joel, mm -hmm. um, that it is a place where uh, Durin has sealed it. Uh, with wards and runes, and it's now broken, which is why the Shadow Curse is leaking in or Morgoth's essence. Oh, so the dwarves were keeping this at bay at one point. The dwarves mm -hmm. were keeping this at bay. It's, oh. it's linked to that thing called the Duty of Durin's Folk. <gasps> yes. It's all coming to friggin' together now. Yes, throughout the game, they reference something that the dwarves are all kind of aware of called the Duty of Durin's Folk. And we've got an excerpt here from the game, read by Trevor about this. Durin's folk will drive the shadows under the earth away. The light of Durin's lamps will long spark bright in his mountain's depths. By Aule's design, this is the duty of Durin's folk. That's pretty cool. That's fucking cool. I like how they, they I mean, they, they tie everything together. Like, mm -hmm. in a nice little bow. Like, they could only drop Morgoth because they needed an evil thing, and this evil thing is linked to Durin's folk's duty, which was given by Aule. So, like, they're able to reach out to these places where it's yeah it makes sense to it's and fucking impressive honestly is what I, the word mm. that's coming to mind for me impressive lore building they did a bang up job on the lore building holy shit i i'm yeah we should have wrote for this game this would have been a <laughs> sick gig past the well of shadow you uh, find the dragon and you confront it and so you're in this like small cave or whatever and you're like doing circles around the area and you're being assailed by orcs and there are fell beasts flying around and there's drakes and they're and this the dragon is like just in the middle inaccessible like shooting fireballs at you and they're all like purple shadowy flame fireballs mm -hmm. and uh yeah so you just kill a bunch of motherfuckers no problem and shozone's like whatever flies away again like <laughs> like fuck you god damn it is that all you're good at? Running? Yeah. Feeling confident in her victory. She's going to take you on in the Balrog's Lair. Ooh, what's the Balrog's Lair like? What's it look like? Is it all burnt up and shit? It's not, actually. It's not? No. He keeps a clean house? Well, I mean, he hasn't been there for a while. Oh, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so Shazon has made it sort of her lair now. Wow. But uh, you chase her there, and you know, I spent, a, I spent a, a good few minutes just trying to stab her with the spear, and it wasn't doing anything. <laughs> Like, and I was it, like, again, the game's not hard, so I wasn't dying or anything, but it's just like poking away and nothing was happening. And uh, I noticed that she was like smashing the ground and stuff. And then I look up and there's like this wooden structure kind of like scaffolding that's just all across the top. And there's big pillars and these pillars. I was like, I wonder if I wonder if these could be destroyed. And uh, so, yeah, you can start beating away at the pillars. Uh, she'll start, you know, she's like throwing fireballs and swinging around trying to hit you. And so she actually hits them, too. And when you destroy them, it all comes crashing down. And lo and behold, there's one of those large crystal structures embedded in the ceiling that emit light. And uh, this light causes the dragon to reel. Weakness. It's weakness, the very light. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, so then I, you know, I tried the spear again, and, oh my god, it just absolutely wrecks her. It was like four nice. or five swings, dragon's dead. Nice. Very cool. All right, all right. Dragon Spain. Once you've killed the dragon, suddenly now you can craft up some, uh, cool other mithril stuff, right? 
I mean, the game is basically, we're, we're basically almost to the end here, but uh, so you don't really get to craft any more mithril stuff until you've defeated the final boss. Gotcha. Which is, uh, it, there's like, uh, there's a hammer because you need that hammer to repair the bridge to Kaza, of Kaza Doom. Okay. Uh, you can craft some, uh, some mithril armor and uh, like a mithril, like a weapon pickaxe. Oh, cool. Right? Okay. It's like a big, a big one. We actually learned that's called a matic. A matic. Yeah. It's a weaponized yes. pickaxe. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly what it's called. We looked it up in a previous episode. I don't remember what it was. That's awesome. So with the new, uh, with your new mithril hammer, you can go and repair the Well of Shadow, put up the runes and seal it off so that way the Shadow Curse can be put at bay again. The duty of Durin. <laughs> the duty of Durin. Duty. Duty. Durin's funk. <laughs> duty. And uh, you also gain the ability to craft Durin's lamp or lamps, if you will. Oh, the crystal lamps. The crystal lamps, yeah. So you can go around to the different parts and uh, you can place them where the shadow curse is leaking out in cracks because it's it does that throughout Kaza Doom. And the the fun thing about those lamps is they don't actually activate until you sing a little song next to them. Oh, fun! Okay. Which yeah. is which is pretty fun. Hell yeah! So you will then make your way back to the bridge of Kaza Doom. You repair it. You'll make your way across. You'll bust down that stupid cursed gate. And right on the other side of it is a nice big hall with the Dimril Gate. And this is the end of the game. There's technically like two end of the game cutscenes. Um, one of them you go out the other gate, doors of Durin. Oh, the West Gate. The West Gate, and like some merchant just meets you outside. Is like, oh my god, you made it out. We're gonna start up trade routes with all the local places, and like name drop name drops a bunch of like kingdoms and stuff, which is pretty cool. Okay, but it's sort of like a pseudo ending, right? Like it's not the the true ending. Sure, sure. So true ending is through the Dimril Gate, and on the outside you meet with uh, King Thorin and Gimli, and there's a bunch of other dwarves out there, and we have an excerpt. Uh, from this very cutscene that plays at the end, and it, it is the ending cutscene. There's nothing else after this, and we're going to have it read by Joel. It was a pickaxe, laughed Gimli. All along, Uncle Ballin thought it was a great weapon and a dragon. Oh, I, you have some tales to tell, Lord of Moria. Alas, I may not be here when Durin returns. I made promises, you see, to meet Aragorn at Minas Tirith, see Merry and Pippin again and to make one final trip with Legolas. Perhaps hear the Lady of the Wood again, but your story doesn't end here, oh no. This is your company now. May its deeds be long remembered. Gimli holds a mug of ale up in your honor. Farewell, and may the luck of the dwarves be ever with you. I love that at the end of the game, you basically get like a pep talk, in a way, from Gimli. Yeah, mm-hmm. dude, you get straight up praise from Gimli. That's pretty sick. And like, yeah, if you're getting awesome. it from Gimli, that's high praise. Yeah, yeah, that's He's what, probably that's, like the most yeah. famous dwarf at this time. I literally, yeah. I love how he refers to his journey to Valinor. Right? Yeah, there. when mm-hmm. he says he might get to see the Lady of the Wood. Yeah, again. and yeah, he says one last trip with Legolas. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And that that's all, folks. The the the, the that's all, folks. <laughs> <laughs> As far as the as far as the chronological story of Return to Moria goes, that's that's the story, right? You you blow your way in, you kill a bunch of orcs, you kill a dragon, uh, you you find some cool places, and then you get out the other side. Mm. So it's all about the stuff you do along the way. Yeah, yeah. It's the friends you meet along the way, and it's a pretty fun journey. Uh, I would say it's a it, again next to some other like crafting survival games. Um, some of the stuff is is a little simplified or dumbed down, but it's uh it's good it's good it's yeah. good there's okay. there they had to they do a couple of patches in the time that i was playing it i literally spent several hours trying to find just drake scales yeah and, and, and i had to create like a whole new world and, and do some other stuff to find the stuff i needed but they fixed that after i had my problem and for people i'm gonna speak for the layman again a patch is uh, a small update to yes. fix something broken with a game correct <laughs> That's right. Uh, is that right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a patch is, is an update or a fix or, you know, that kind of stuff. So a couple of those came out in the course of you playing the game? Yep. Okay, cool. They did. They did. There were a couple of bugs. Were they big ones or? No, nah, no, nah, they weren't big. Just little bugs. They, they had to, yeah, they had to fix a couple of things that just um, kind of didn't work the way they were supposed to. And, you know, once the patch was done, it was, it worked. So it was, it was good. And just uh, how many patches for the Golem game came out while you were playing it? Were there a lot? There should have been. 
God, you know, I don't actually know. I don't think that I had updated the game at all in my playthroughs. Oh, really? You just played the... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't have a lot of, like, actual big like, game-breaking bugs. I just had mm. some dumb shit. Yeah. And and some of the dumb shit was, was designed directly into the game, so you're not patching that. <laughs> yeah, you can't. It's in the DNA of this game. It, we it is, man. It's in the bones. You can't. Yeah, it's in the bones. Yeah, my understanding is they came out with like a final update for the Gollum game, and to, then we're just like, we're to sorry. Make, yeah, to try to make it like playable at mm-hmm. least, and then they yeah they stepped away and we're like, we're sorry, we're sorry, no more. Yeah, I think most of the patching stuff for that game was just to fix a couple of bugs that would crash the game. Yeah, mm. otherwise not a whole lot of like um, I don't know functional patches. Whereas this game had functional patches, things that actually improved quality of life, is a word we often use for that stuff. Okay. Okay, so let's move on to some terms so we can just learn a little bit more about the, the lore of this game. Okay. Uh, the first thing, one of the major things, the Shadow Curse. Um, integral. It, integral. Some kind of shadow darkness that plagues Moria. Uh, it's not the same thing as being in dark without light, although it does put you in darkness. Uh, it is said that it drains courage and energy, making it hard for even the sturdiest of dwarves to do anything. Mm. Uh, and as we talked about earlier, it, it gives you an effect of despair, which damages you over time. Yeah, the only way to get rid of it is to, to leave it, more or less. Just bottle it all up inside, yeah, spot, right? Bottle up it and, and get and away never from talk it. about it the healthy way. The uh, the curse is caused by the Shadow Well, uh, which is that bit where Morgoth's energy is coming through. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's sort of indirectly caused by Morgoth. Yeah, indirectly caused, caused by Morgoth. As all misery is. <laughs> and uh, as we had also stated, there's a bunch of cracks that this is leaking through. Um, it also appears that the Shadow Curse doesn't have any negative effect on evil creatures. Like, as far as I can tell, like, the dragon sure. seemed fine or, okay. or very dragon-like anyway, so it probably was just buffed. Uh, and there are orcs that you fight that also um, are affected by it that use it against you. So they, yeah. can, they can just hit you and curse you, which is... So for them, it's almost like a positive effect. Like you said, yeah. it, bu- it gives them a buff. Yeah, it makes them strong. Ooh. Uh, another thing that's very integral to the game, of course, since we mentioned it, is finding Durin's axe. Mm-hmm. Uh, plays a major part in the plot, and finding the axe is... Uh, the pieces are it's actually necessary in order to continue. Uh, we've got a, a quick excerpt regarding the axe, read by Danny. Balin is possessed with the need to find Durin's axe. He is convinced it is needed for our venture to succeed. We have found records of it, though we cannot make out all of the ancient runes, perhaps dating to the passing of Durin I. It was powerful, used in Durin's great victory. To share its power across all of khazad it was broken into five fragments and mounted at vital parts of the realm. It includes descriptions of each location, much changed by time. Still, we will set outposts near each and begin a great search. Man, if they were having issues reading those ancient runes, they should have just hired David Salo. Yeah, dude. King. King I, David Salo. I know when looking up Durin's axe, the sources I looked at stated that uh, Balin actually did find it. Yeah. And then he claimed it as his own. Oh. Mm. I hadn't heard that. I did know that it was generally accepted that Balin found it based on yep. the text in the chamber of, in the Book of Mizarvel, But What they said, yeah, it said a date and something, Durin's Axe. Durin's Axe. Yeah. That's one change from the lore, I would say, is that it seems like Balin and company did not find it, but they left you clues to find it. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So I suppose that is a, a modification, yeah. And uh, it, it directly ties into the Shadow Curse because it can ward off the Shadow Curse and, and break the curse. Oh, yeah, the, the Durin's Axe can break that curse. That's what you're saying. It breaks through those doors that were sealed with the curse. The curse. And so let's talk a bit about that ending, too. So you defeat all the major evils in Moria. There's still threats. You know, there's orcs and things still prowling about. Insurgency. And uh, you know, trolls and wargs. Like, you can still find these things. So, the, you know, basically the ending of the game is you just kind of go back and, you know, keep playing in inside of Moria. But I kind of think it would have been fun if your character ended up being the last reincarnation of Durin. That would yeah. have been super cool. <laughs> you had mentioned that because the, the dwarf that you're playing, while you do uh, give yourself a name to the character, nobody calls you by that name. Right. Nobody calls you by that name. Uh, it is it is known that Durin the Last is supposed to come back and take Casa Doom, and I mean you basically do that. Like you take out the major evils. Right. And there's still stuff in there, but like you could have been. Yeah, should... it does kind of seem like like you you could very well be Durin the yeah. Seventh, Durin the Last. It would have uh, it would have been an interesting twist. However, I can see why it might not make sense because you could play this with you know eight total people and you can't all be durin oh yeah i suppose that makes sense that'd be funny <laughs> right right Durin the last is actually eight dwarves it's a hive mind that'd be cool what if 
Everyone yeah. that you played with was all a different incarnation of Durin, one through seven. Yeah, so you could cool. only have seven Durins. That would be cool. You could only have seven players with you. We are Durin. Actually, it would be really cool to play through that game with seven people, but you're all like one of each Durin. You name yourself each Durin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you go through as uh, your own little playthrough. Anywho. <laughs> Let's. Uh, <laughs> that is, that is, it's fun. It's fun. Speaking of fun little side things you could do, let's talk about the side content in the game. Um, now, there's a good chance I might have missed some things. Like as I said earlier, there was something I found after already completing the game. Um, one of those chests. So this is a. Uh, this is going to be just the stuff I found, and possibly you might find things on your own. One of the cool things you can find are signs of the fellowship. Uh, just throughout the journey, you can find different things, um, like Pippin's hat. You or sorry, Pippin's stone. You find Gandalf's hat. Um, you find some Shire made uh, like plates and cutlery, Thick. which is pretty cool. I thought that was all really cool. Little yeah, little odes, little flavor. The trash left behind yeah, by yeah. the fellowship. There's like a specific like marker where uh, Gandalf falls with uh, Durin's bane, um, and you even find evidence of the cave troll encounter in the chamber of Mazarbel, oh, which cool. is pretty cool. Oh, fun! Okay. That's awesome. Okay, okay. Yeah, I suppose there's plenty of shit to reference. Reference back to plenty of events. Oh, yeah. There's a ton of history in Casa Doom, which is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's also runes left by Gandalf, which he likes to do. Right. Yeah. Gandalf, uh, we had mentioned a rune that he had left at the crossroads, but there are many other runes that you find uh, that just kind of give you hints or something uh, about what to expect in the area. And these are old. They're from Gandalf's uh, visit when he was looking for Balin. Oh. Um, except for except for one of them, all of them are from when he first came in there for that. Gotcha. You also find some rangers' journals. These are just journals that are left by Thorngill, referencing the eagles Ooh. under the mountain. And um, you just find pages and, and put them back in, and they teach you how to make brews. So more or less, it's just a little flavor and a way to advance your craft. Yeah. I thought it was cool that they would attribute specific brews to a ranger's journal. And not just any ranger, but this mysterious Thorngill. Thorngill, Eagle of the Star, also known as Aragorn II. Aragorn II. Son of Arathorn. Son of Arathorn. Elissa and Vinyatar. Yeah, this is, uh, doesn't, isn't this the time he goes and he doesn't talk about it? Yes. Yep, right? He's yes. Like, yes. <laughs> this is when he'd rather not talk about it. Yep. Yeah, yeah, Aragorn did not enjoy his time <laughs> in Moria. There's also a bunch of cool monuments throughout the game, right? Yeah, there's, uh, there's a monument to each Durin, uh, except for the last, right? Because he hasn't come yet. Because he hasn't come yet. <laughs> Joel, <laughs> sorry, Joel, just, guys. Joel just made an obscene hand gesture when he said that. Uh, yeah, sorry. I suppose you guys that. can't see that on account of it being podcast. But. <laughs> We're mature here. We're real. We're in our thirties. <laughs> so on on these uh, monuments, there's usually some kind of an inscription, and uh, you can sing a song. You can sing a song at a lot of parts of this game, but specifically, if you sing a song at one of these monuments, you get a nice temporary buff, and you learn some lore. Oh, fun! Well, let's uh, get a excerpt one of these one of these songs that you can sing, and we're gonna have this read by Trevor, the eldest of the seven fathers. He slept alone with our people's stone. When Durin woke and walked alone, he named the nameless hills and dells. He stooped and looked in Miromir and saw a crown of stars appear. Under silvered peaks, he found our home in these halls, this Khazadun. A king he is on carven throne in many pillared halls of stone. The harpers harped, the minstrels sang, and at the gates the trumpets rang. Deathless is he, we do not weep. Seven he shall be to awake from sleep. Dang, that was cool. Yeah, I thought that was kind of a cool remix of the Song of Durin. Yeah, Tolkien would have loved that. Yeah, because it's got a handful of lines pulled directly from the Song of Durin. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's clearly its own thing. Yeah. Yeah, they kind of like took some of those parts and added them in some other new parts and uh, shortened it up a lot. I mean, the Song of Durin, I think I think it was done in a previous episode, right? Yeah, it's much longer. It's much longer. It's much mm -hmm. longer, yeah. Mm-hmm. So we also find uh, several altars called Muzanakun throughout Khazad Doom. Ooh. And these are like dedicated to uh, certain dwarf families. And they have a bunch of carved figurines on top of them that you go about finding and, re and replacing them. Oh, fun. Okay. So the different lines or families we have is Ori, Narvi, uh, Garin, Durin, and Telkar. Telkar, shout out. Elkar, the famous yeah, you, smith. You mentioned him earlier. Yeah. And uh, when you when you replace all these, you open them up and you get to learn some new runes for crafting. Very cool. Right. And uh, so the concept of these altars, the Muzanakun, this is also unique to this game, but another very cool lore addition. Yep. Yeah, kind of just like a, a, a neat side content. Let's talk about some of the baddies, some of the creatures, some of the things, the denizens of 
<laughs> Cause of doom. Moria. Moria. Of course, we have Durin's Bane. Now, we, he's long gone by the time we're here, uh, but he's referenced uh, quite a few times. The mm-hmm. orcs like talk about him being gone, and um, you even fight the final boss in his lair, so it's cool to reference Durin's Bane. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, trolls are around, of course. Uh, mostly, they're just difficult enemies to fight, and uh, there's no like actual light that hurts them, like that would kill them, so they can be a little bit formidable. Oh, really? They're not affected by the light? Yeah, not at all. Didn't hmm. seem like it. Interesting, because... In lore, trolls are the only thing we know of that explicitly turn to stone in light. In sunlight, though. In sunlight. Oh, right. Sunlight, right, yeah. specifically. These sunlight. are like true quartz light, which uh, still affected the dragon, but... Oh, huh. mm, okay. But anyway. All right. Uh, there's a bunch of animals and wildlife. I thought these would be interesting to go through, because like when you think of Kaza Doom, what do you think is living in there? Like, yeah, what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah, other than orcs and spiders and shit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, or- yeah, orcs and spiders, definitely one. Giant spiders. We got some cool named things, like the Benamoon, which is just a big pig. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice. right. A were pig. A were pig. A, a, di- yeah. a dire pig. A dire <laughs> pig. <laughs> uh, we've got something called a Hriwaris, which is a pale white deer named by the elves. Um, these are attracted to elven power, so like you find them in the, in the elven quarter pretty easily. Okay. Uh, there's other things like giant moths. There's snack rats, which is just a rodent. Wargs. They're sure. often with the orcs. And there's warg demons, which are which it says here is the original form of all wargs that barely cling to flesh and blood and are closer to shadow than life. Oh, which weird. Which is okay. kind of a neat uh, that is, explanation. That's a cool concept. Okay. Uh, there's there's a bunch of wolves prowling about. Um, and of course, there's there's like cavern bats, which are just annoying. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. That, oh, wait. There's also big bears. The bears are kind of tough, but... Oh, bears. Yeah, All right. there are bears, of course. Dire bears. The dire bear. Subterranean dire bear. Yeah, I, one thing I would not want to come across in Moria is a subterranean bear. Yeah, yeah. No, That sounds you. pretty intense. No, thank you, you're, sir. You're screwed in that situation. Let's talk about that damn dragon and some of its its kindred. Yeah, the dragon's full name is Narag Shazon. Um, and actually, I mean, I feel like we learned very little about this character, despite it being like your main baddie. Mm-hmm. I suppose this is kind of like your main. This is kind of like your main antagonist for the story. Your your big boss. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the final battle. I I assume the dragon is a, a fey Loki or a spirit dragon. Ah, uh, we just learned about those because it breathes like a, a like a shadow flame, and it seems like it has the ability to place curses using the shadow, or like maybe its own version of dragon spell kind of thing. Cool. That's some nice Tolkieniering, Trevor. You literally, we just learned about the uh, the fail, okay, the spark or the spirit dragon. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and the I mean, the cool thing about the dragon is it. I mean, it fits lore too. It is a four legged dragon with wings. Nice, nice, nice. dig it, dig Solid. it. It's it. It is lore accurate as far as that stuff is concerned. Cool. Um, and at one point, while you're walking through the desolation of Durin's Bane, your character has a voice line making a statement about how Sauron had used the dragon to breed the fell beasts that the Nazgul used. Oh. That's an interesting tie-in. Okay. Interesting. I did always wonder where those came from. Interesting, interesting. Then we got drakes, too, which we mentioned in the dragons episode as well. Yeah. They're mostly just giant lizards that can't fly. Per- um, perverted lizards yeah. that can't fly. They, they've got some nests, and you can destroy their like eggs or whatever, and then they'll come and fight you. That's rude. Okay. They also can shoot like ice blasts at you. Oh, cool. Okay. Very fun, very fun. And we we mentioned these uh, before, the fell beasts. Yeah, as far as the game is concerned, the fell beasts are, they're just drakes that can fly, and they're harder to kill. Okay. So so yeah. they're kind of leathery, and you know they're not really scaly, right? I think, no, they're all scaly. Oh, they're, they are scaly. They're all scaly. Okay. okay. So this form of fell beast is a scaly beast. Scaly beast. I think in the text, they're supposed to be more bird-like with a beak and things, mm-hmm. like a naked bird. So I guess this would be a little bit of an adjustment to the lore. I'm pretty sure. But I can dig it. I'm pretty, like, they drop scales, so I, I'm assuming um, it's yeah, a, a, yeah. they looked like they're kind of scaly, but they could have been somewhat not scaly, maybe. Yeah. If they drop scales, it only makes sense that they might have scales. Yeah. Yeah, th- this uh, this next thing they extrapolate from the, uh, the uh, text as well, the nameless creatures of the deep. The nameless creatures of the deep, they're, they're a cool thing. Uh, they're, you can only find them in the deeps, those places where, like I said, you find precious minerals and mithril. Okay. Uh, but mostly, they, like, they just look like large cave bears or like big wargs, and they're surrounded in like a shadowy mist. Like It's like emanating off of them like heat. Oh. So there's some kind of big cursed mammal beasts. Something. Okay. Something like mm-hmm. that. And supposedly, these creatures are older and fouler than even the orcs. And orcs are pretty goddamn old. Like or older, from their inception, anyway. Fouler things than are they, orcs in the deep <laughs> places, places of the world. world. Are they pretty hard to kill? Uh, yeah, <laughs> they have a huge health pool. They hit like a truck, and uh, you, like you could spend a while trying to kill one. I did. I did take one down out of curiosity. Mm-hmm. It, it took a while. I used a lot of arrows and sort of glitched the game in a way to do it. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, Trevor's good at that, exploiting and, the game yeah, design. Ex- ex- exploit the environment, very <laughs> yeah. much so. And, uh, yeah, they, they drop garbage. Like, you don't get anything useful. That's dumb. That it, it's not worth the effort. Like, you, oh, you for might such get a some big hide. fight, you don't get anything, like, super cool? No, not at all, unfortunately. You get some meat, maybe. Like, mm. not worth it. Yeah. Meat ripe off the bone. <laughs> This next section, I'm uh, super interested in as a uh, amateur sociologist. This really interests me. The different tribes of Orkor. Yeah. Some of these you might actually recognize a bit from our previous episode. Mm-hmm. On, oh, on, on the orcs. orcs. Yeah. See, we've 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 gone over Balrog, Dragon, and now Orcs, guys. Yeah. Orcs. Oh my! We're, yeah. we're, we're, <laughs> oh my! We're touching on all three. <laughs> yeah, Orcs was actually just uh, episode previous to this one, ninety two. Go check it. Check it out. The cause of doom contains many different orcs uh, and variations thereof and the orcs have strongholds and small camps that are set up throughout Khazad Dun. and if you lay waste to their encampments it'll limit their numbers and their patrols because they they patrol around okay so let's go over the different tribes we've got the Moria tribe of course which was the first tribe to set up in Moria after the Balrog woke up okay the OGs the OGs we have the goblin men which are remnants of those bred by Saruman Ooh. I was wondering about that when that's how they got there earlier yeah. on when you said early in the game you came across some goblin men in a lit chamber I was like how did goblin men get in more I guess that makes sense that they'd get to Moria after the fall of Saruman I don't yeah. imagine all of the goblin men died so no that's cool. That's cool. I dig yeah. it. We also have the deep orcs, which, uh, from what I could tell, the only thing that makes them special is the depth you find them. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So, yeah. They're not. They're not like wise orcs. They're just. They're uh, like. Yeah, yeah. They're deeps, not. They're not that deep. Like when they deep say, sea fish down in the Hadel zone. <laughs> We're right. talking specifically about elevation. Yeah. <laughs> We've next got the red eye orcs, which are specifically orcs from Mordor. Mm. Oh, I thought they were just real stoned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're real slow or Yeah, they're uh, real slow. They eat just constantly. Constantly eating. And they're just always listening to Cheech and Chong records. It's fucking annoying, dude. Worst orcs. Worst orcs out there. We then have the Gundabad orcs. Mm, we learned about these. Of course. Yeah, Gundabad orcs. Right. As the name states, they're from Gundabad. Mm-hmm. They're also enemies with the red eye orcs. Oh, Ooh, okay. They so like, they've got their own like little qualms and things. So they the hate tribes. the stone orcs. Are they, po- they hate- are they policemen? I mean... Well, these are the DEA orcs. <laughs> these the are D- the DEA orcs, yeah. Oh, my God. The fucking fed orcs. Well, you can find them like while you're like, like walking around and stuff. They'll just be fighting each other, and you can just kind of chill back. But if you get close enough, they'll just turn on you because they hate you more than they hate each other. Mm. So they'll all just start fighting you instead. That's handy. And they kind of like state that in some of the flavor texts on the sides. They're like, oh, I hate them uh, red eye orcs, but I hate dwarves even more. <laughs> well, you, know, you, just, you just hear them talking random stuff. That's funny. Um, there's a lot of orc banter you get to hear. Oh, yes. There's, okay, I think they patched this up. But one of the things I was dealing with was in one of my camps, I would just be like going about my business and I would just hear this orc in the background just screaming for his life like something was coming after him. He's like, ah, ah. And it was just, it would just happen every now and then. And I'm and like, it was, there's it, nothing to it. It was just a, it was nothing. Yeah. No event or anything was happening. I couldn't see where they were. <laughs> like one of the weird bugs is them. you could like, no matter where you were, you could hear an orc talking to another orc, like oh, were right like next the, to you. Like the proximity yeah. volume was a little wonky. Yeah. There was, yeah. The sound was a bit wonky when it came to that stuff. And uh, so you would just randomly hear some like conversation or like flavor text from an orc talking. <laughs> like he's whispering <laughs> into your mind because you can't see them. <laughs> I see. But moving on to the last of our orcs, we have the Shadow Orcs. These are my guys. These are your guys. Previously, the tribe of Gash. Or Gash? How would you say that? Gosh. 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 Yeah. Gosh. Which uh, I believe, if I remember from the from the, the text, is Gandalf says is the orcish word for fire. Mm-hmm. It, would, it would make sense because these orcs used to be under the thrall of the Balrog. Yes. And I was talking about to, to Trevor. I was like, wouldn't it be cool if one of the groups uh, worshipped the Balrog? Yeah, we were talking about that in the orc episode. Yeah. And yeah. then this came after yeah. that, which was like super cool. Super friggin' cool. Seriously. If there's any game development companies or people working on Tolkien shows or movies that want to hire Keep on Tolkien Podcast <laughs> on their writing staff, hit us up. Join the Discord, dude. We love to make lore. Yes, we do. So after we're done here with the creatures of the darkness, we should move on to some important locations because there are a lot of places, a lot more than I actually feel like I can remember sometimes. Okay, that, I mean, that you yeah, Casa Doom is a huge, it's huge place. It's a huge place. Three mountain peaks underneath. So Return to Moria as a game is has a, pr- a pretty large map 
and it is uh, it's randomly generated so when you start the game you, you you pick like there's a number called a seed and that seed basically determines what the map is going to be so you well, can your use, random generation well, yeah, yeah would what, be. It, what it's going to be and yeah. you can use the same seed if you want to play the same layout or, or but you could pick ah. a different one and so like every playthrough is going to be different based on a different seed for the map that's cool i like that and it is uh basically split into four major sections so if you say open the map up you would have four different sections with other mini sections in them those are the western halls the lower deeps dwar delf and berezinbar okay and they're split into smaller parts of the hole which divides all the sections of casa doom so here is a list of some of the unique unique locations that you encounter important ones that are fun so of course we have the Doors of Durin, which is the western entrance to the mountain, also known as the Holland Gate. I had never heard that one. Mm. Yes, that's because the land of Holland is just outside that gate. Or at least yeah. the land that used to be known as Holland is right outside that gate. Yeah, I believe it was... Uh, Holland is like the name of the... Uh, like I, the region? Or? The region, because it was called Holland, and then it was called the Region, and now it's called Holland again. <laughs> gotcha. It just means land of holly. There's a lot of holly that grows there. Oh, yeah. Okay. Name it after what it is. Why not? Right. Uh, speaking of that, it's also called the Elven Door. Ah, yes, because the elves would enter there for trade. Yeah, Celebrimbor and his homies. Yeah. Heck yeah. Uh, we've got Westgate, which is a settlement on the inner slopes of Casa Doom. Cool. We have uh, the Dimril Gate, which is the eastern entrance and the original to Casa Doom, also known as the East Gate or the Great Gates. We have the Mines of Moria, which everybody knows, and you know the namesake of the game. Mm-hmm. The Mines. So we're returning here. Mm-hmm. Uh, in this specific area, you can find a lot of materials. You can't find Mithril. We found Mithril under Karadhras, mm. but uh, according to this game's lore, uh, it was still significant for the great wealth and prosperity of the dwarves for a time. Karadhras, it, also known as Barazinbar. Barazinbar. Oh, you see, I didn't make that connection until just now. Thank you. Yeah, Karadhras is the as the uh, elvish Sindarin version of the name, and then Barazinbar is the dwarvish version of that same. Karadhras is the red horn, right? Mm-hmm. That's cool. Thank you for that addition. Yeah. That's what we're here for today, baby. Yes, yeah. that's what we do. Supporting, supporting uh, role here. All right, so next on our list, we have Durin's Highway, which is an area unique to this game, uh, also known as the Great Road of Zirak Zigul. Is this the same yeah. as the Pilgrim's Road? It is not. Um, specifically, this one is not in the deeps where the Pilgrim's Road is. This is like oh, on, the, okay. on the upper levels. Higher in elevation, I see. Okay. And it's supposed to connect the doors of Durin and the town of Westgate to the Dimril Gate in the city of Dwarrow Delph. Oh, so it's literally like the main road that goes across. Oh, it's an interstate highway. Kind of. It's a good way to think of it, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and uh, apparently, according to this game's lore, it's the path that the Fellowship took. Oh! oh okay. To go from one gate to the other. So it kind of a neat way of explaining that. Yeah, Dur- yeah. Endurance Highway, let me slip away on you. I also like that they gave it an also known as, like they gave it two things to make it sound more legit than it is. <laughs> yeah, very, very Tolkien. Very Tolkien. Awesome. The only way they could have made it more Tolkien is if it had more names. More names, yeah. Right, more yeah. names, like five more. Four different names, yeah. Yes, the high, yes, the Durin's Highway, aka the Road of Zirak Ziggle, aka the Damned Road, aka the Road of Moria, aka the <laughs> the Deep Road, aka you know, who, who fucking knows? Known in the Elder Days as the the, the, the only elves, road. <laughs> the elves once heard of it and called it blah 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 yeah. blah, and know. the men they called it blah 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 blah. <laughs> Speaking of elves, next on our list is the Elven Quarter. Mm. Heck yeah. Which, uh, so according to the game lore, it's a cavern that was provided by the, or to the Noldor elves by the dwarves to use as their madrugnud, which they don't give any context yeah. for what that word is, and we could not find out I mm, could not what it is. I googled it for like a, a, a strangely long amount of time, and I could not yeah, find yeah. what it meant. I Yeah, I was all over the place, too, trying to figure it out. Oh, you look, too? That's yeah, funny. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't find yeah, it. That brings us to believe that it's, again, another Coos dual word that they developed for this game. However, we even within the game, we can't quite figure yeah. out exactly what it means. If, if there's a lore bit in this game explaining that, I didn't find it, and I'm not sure where you put. Oh, it's a madrug. But it's a nude. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's got a fun long name, and uh, but like we explained before, you know, it's a it's a big area. It's built with elven craft, um, and trees and animals and plants are thriving here. It's beautiful. Uh, because the, the light. I mean, it, I know we said it is not the sun, so it wouldn't hit affect the trolls, but I mean, it does help plants to grow it is like yeah dwarven grow lamps so it does yeah. it does the job uh the next place we talked about this a bit the lower deeps mm. 
which uh, is an area deep under the mountain where many gems and rare minerals can be found. Oh, this is this is where the uh, refugees from Belgost and uh, Norgrad settled. Yeah, this place. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we talked about it. We talked about this. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. uh, with the way this game does it, the, the everything is split like there's the upper levels and the lower levels. Gotcha. After that, we have the Great Forges, which we touched on. Uh, most of them, I believe, in the story section. Um, I think there's one or two that are kind of off the side that don't have any main story impact, so I did not include them. Um, but they're they're basically just in here to have unique ways to craft special tools and tools that are themed after that particular dwarven type of dwarf craft. Right, okay. Cool. So okay. the so the Belagost Forge had Belagost armor gotcha. and some other stuff like that. Yeah, the Great Forges. And also the lower deeps that we just talked about. These both of these things are technically unique to the game, but I mean they're so I don't I don't know they seem so like common sense that they mm-hmm. it's hard to say that they're not because Easily. obviously they would have forges everywhere. Right. And the lower deeps of Khazad Doom are a thing. Like yeah, I would say it's easily extrapolated from the lore. Very easily. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of given form in the game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Next we have the drain pumps, uh, which is another area that we found was unique to the game. Uh, it is stated in the game's lore that it's used by Bel- it was used by Belagost for defense against the creatures of the lower deeps. So they oh. could like drain water in and I guess move it oh, around. So you don't oh. have to worry about the watchers in the water if there ain't no water. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just let them dry up in the sun. That'd be funny. And lastly, we have the crystal descent, uh, which we had stated earlier is also unique to the game. Uh, it's just a big natural crystal shaft that leads to the lower deeps. And the name of the crystal is the true quartz that we talked about. Mm-hmm. It's it's everywhere in here. You can collect a bunch of it. You can make little torches and things out of it. Um, it's just a it's just a crystal that glows all the time. So it's useful for lighting your way around. I think that's cool. Cool. There's some other places too, but these these ones are kind of the major ones that are that are the most interesting, in my opinion. Okay. Very yeah. cool. Hell yeah. Let's get into the the gameplay aspect of the game. Yeah, so so far we've just kind of talked about mostly what stuff is contained in the game, but now let's talk about how you actually interact with it. Uh, I'm going to split it up into two sections. We've kind of got at camp and outside of camp. Right. So being that this is a crafting slash survival game, uh, there's base buildings, base building. So one of the first things that you will probably do is make camp somewhere because you need to have a place to build stuff so you can craft stuff. Of course. Uh, To make a camp, you need a hearth of some type, and the size of the hearth basically gives you how much area you have to build. And you can't build most of the structures without a hearth, so you need to build it. It's basically the backbone of your camp. Um, You can build walls and floors, doors and stairs, and even columns to form your home. Um, And it's not really necessary. You don't have to go to town on building walls and things, but it's useful to help keep, like, wandering orcs and things out of your camp from destroying it. Oh, so your camps are not necessarily a safe space unless you make it so? Exactly. Oh, that's that makes it interesting, I bet. A little bit, yeah, because uh, we'll, we'll talk about hordes in a bit, but hordes of orcs can come at you, and so oh. having defenses I, is, is I pretty I was good. watching when you were getting attacked by hordes in your camp at yeah. that point. Yeah, it, it, it can be can be hectic. Yeah. Uh, but if your defenses are good, it you know, doesn't really matter. You can make your base out of wood, stone, granite, and adamant, and different things can be made with uh, stronger materials, and they hold a better to enemies that are trying to attack them. Naturally, okay. Uh, so wood will break faster than stone, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the structures also have an integrity system tied to them, so you can only build up so high or so far out without having, like, support under them. Oh, that's pretty cool. So you have to use a, a little bit of uh, tact when figuring out how you're going to build your base. That's pretty cool. Architecture architecture nerds will like that. Engineering nerds, right? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's pretty simple, um, but it's just complicated enough to, like, make you think about it, which is part of the okay. fun. Cool. Making it a strategic game without making it inaccessible to people who are just interested in nerding out. Yes, exactly. That's cool. I th- I feel like if we're taking anything away from this game review is that they struck that balance and they nailed that shit. They they struck it in a way that makes it uh, functional and not too complicated, but doesn't do anything new or exciting. So you would say this game is pretty mm. mass appeal when it comes to the, the fandom of Lord of the Rings? Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you were playing this game for lore, you'll have a great time. If you're playing it just for the gameplay and you don't care about Lord of the Rings, you'll find better crafting survival games okay. to play. That's a, that's a brilliant way to put it. Cool. Uh, so after you have your base set up, you need to put in other things like, uh, you know, decorations, chests to store your items and things. Yeah, we all need decorations. So one of the things you can, <laughs> yeah, you want to spice it up, live the dwarf life. So you can build some monuments, uh, a few of them. You can build like a gold hoard um, where you just, you could put gold in it and uh, just kind of show off your wealth. Not that it's all that important. It's a very dwarvish thing very to do. Very dwarvish, though. yeah. 
Um, you can build a memorial flame, which is like a statue of a dwarf holding an urn, and you can build a Durin's lamp, which is a lamp made from adamant and true quartz. Thick. Can you have multiple Durin's lamps? Because it's just something you can make, like daggers or something? Yeah, you can build a bunch of them if you want to. Um, per base, you, I mean, you really only need one, because all you do with these monuments is you sing a song, or you just you just touch them, and you get like a, a small buff for a while. Oh, okay. Cool, awesome. cool. Which a buff is just uh, some kind of uh, status enhancement. Yeah, like positive right. side effects. Yes, for the layman, a buff. Yeah, buff. A buff. A, bu- a bonus, a if bonus. you will. Yeah. Uh, you also need a bed. Beds, because uh, resting and sleeping is important in this game. There's a there's a day and night cycle, even though you're in a cave under the mountain. <laughs> there's still a day and night cycle. Still got to rest. Um, and you still got to rest. There's a few beds uh, that you can build, and the higher the quality, the better the buff you get from waking up. So it also helps you, other than just restoring your uh, stamina. It also s- serves as a respawn point, so if you die, you will respawn there. You can only have one respawn point at a time, but you can make as many beds as you want. So you can have one in each of your camps if you build multiple camps. Uh, this game also has fast travel, uh, which is basically just instantaneous travel from point A to point B. You build uh, map stones, and you can find some of them throughout Moria as well. And they need to be built near a hearth in order to, well, in order to build them. But you can destroy the hearth afterwards and still function. I thought that was cool that you can essentially create and and place those fast travel stones almost anywhere you want. Yeah. That, it I makes mean, it, rather than having like predetermined bonfires around, like you can go around and be like, okay, it took me a while to get here. I don't I'm see anything around. Up a, I'm I'm set a, up a marker. Set up yeah. a safe yeah. spot. It's nice that you can set it up in places that you want to have it set up. It doesn't always work properly. I had set up one, and you're supposed to spawn next to it when you travel to it, but I spawned like 30 yards away from it because it I was near I remember that hole. you were like across a chasm and stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little weird, but um, it still worked and I could use it, so that was nice. That was a little glitchy, but yeah. Um, fast traveling also um, has a negative effect on your character, believe it or not. Oh. Uh, it takes some of your... Um, your um what do you call it? your energy you have energy and stamina it takes some of your energy away oh okay um which i'll talk about energy a bit in a bit here so the next thing you can do inside your base you can do some farming um which you just build up like these these plots or boxes and you can just put in um different types of foods and things that you find like i mentioned coos dual oats earlier um you can grow mushrooms and, and other kinds of fruit and things so this um, farming is this this isn't as active as like stardew valley or something like nah, that. nah you just you just put it in the box and then you wait for it to grow oh, okay you don't even have to water it or anything nah. it's just oh. Okay. okay. Some some things require the light of those crystals, or you can build like a lamp that provides light, and other things need the darkness, like mushrooms. Yeah, I uh, I just gotta say because Stardew came up, I love Stardew Valley so much, and I gotta say, Trevor, your playthrough with me, you, and and our editor Ruru, that was some of the best time I've ever wasted in my <laughs> in my entire <laughs> life. I remember I was supposed to be like doing other shit at the time too. I think it was probably supposed to be doing this, yeah, probably. Probably. And uh, and uh, yeah, I was just like, nah, fuck it. We'll play Stardew Valley for four hours in the middle of the day. Whatever. Hell yeah. So moving on to crafting, another major component of this game, you will be building many crafting stations to support your journey in Casa Doom. In a few different types of crafting, you have metalworking, which you would use to make your tools and ingots and other metal items. So you build like forges and furnaces and stuff. Uh, you've got handicrafts, which are like wooden crafts and cloth and leather. Um, so like workbenches, uh, you can build a loom. Um, you even have to build a repair smithy because your gear degrades over time, so you have to keep repairing it. Makes sense. Uh, and then cooking and brewing, which is a, a pretty huge part of the game as well. Um, you make different, you take different materials and things and foods that you find around, and you can craft up meals. And eating meals keeps you fed because you can starve. Yes. But meals, they stay at home. They come on a they they come on a table, and if you don't eat them, they will eventually spoil. And they do give you some kind of buff. There are other types of things like rations you can take with you, which you can think of like your potions or whatever. So you just eat them to heal up and keep yourself fed. Okay. And then when it comes to brews, you can craft up some brews and drink them to give yourself uh, longer buffs that are unique to each type of brew. And you can even sing a song while you're holding one of the brew cups, like and just just for fun. And uh, it'll give you a buff where if you go to sleep, uh, when you wake up, you'll have an even better buff, which is pretty cool. Oh, that is cool. I I remember uh, seeing you do some of these little songs, and they were actually really fun. There are a lot of little uh, songs and things that the dwarves sing in this game. Did did you say there were seven of them? Oh, there's more. Oh, there's more than seven. There's, there's like more. at least twenty. Or there's something. a oh. there's a couple of them where they're they're just like variations of. Yeah. Like one of them is like orc for dinner, and then there's a dragon for dinner, and 
so on. So there's oh, a few okay. different versions of those where they're just slightly different. I was going to say we should sing them for a companion piece, but there seems like there's too many of them. There's a lot that. of them. There's a lot of them. <laughs> um, but they're basically shanties. They're just kind of small sure. deals that are just kind of fun. Yeah. Um, and there's di- yeah, there's different parts of throughout the game where you end up doing that. And you always generally just get a buff from it. I remember watching you. You went through the ending cutscene for me to show me how it ends and there was a glitch out where the credits started and and, and as the credits roll normally uh in the background they just have they play all of these little shanties like back to back to back just yeah as the credits roll oh yeah well, trevor cut the credits short but it didn't stop playing the audio so he just kept <laughs> going through his game and there were just these shanties that would not stop <laughs> they just kept going and the and cool going. thing about the They're shanties really fun. like if you're alone it's your dwarf singing it. But if you have buddies, you're all singing them at the same time. Cool. And so you have like, um, just like vocal harmony. Yeah, it har- yeah, it harmon- the characters harmonize. That's it's, really it's cool. Fun. It's so dope. It's, That's it's, really cool. You can cool. have up to eight players. You can have eight dwarves singing a eight song. Eight dudes or eight people just eight people, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really, really cool. So let's move on to the tools, uh, what food does, and some supplies. So all your tools and armor have a durability to them. Using a tool reduces its durability, and taking damage will lower your armor's durability. Uh, repairs only cost a uh, material called metal scraps, which you find anywhere, but you need to do them at a repair smithy, so you cannot do them while you're out and about. Gotcha. Uh, if a tool or armor runs out of durability, it becomes useless until repaired. So they don't like break, and you have to craft a new one, which is nice. Uh, but you do have to repair them, which limits your time uh, going and exploring. Well, the repair smithies, that's different than like a hearth, right? There's a repair smithy is an actual person you got to go to? No, no, no. A repair smithy uh, is a particular crafting station, if you will, that okay. is just used just to repair. Just for repairs. Oh, yeah. gotcha. So you can use your hearth to create a repair smithy. Yeah, you need the hearth to build anything. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, crafting food is important because it keeps you fed and gives you buffs because your player has a hunger meter and if it's empty, you'll begin to starve and take damage. Uh, eating pretty much anything will help replenish your food meter. Um, eating meals restores more than like eating ingredients. So like if you eat an apple... Uh, eating something cooked is going to be a lot better. Can you eat uh, like poisonous things on accident? I have not tried to eat a poison mushroom. I don't know if it would let me. <laughs> but, oh, but there are poison mushrooms. There are poison mushrooms. Okay. Yeah. Is it like Bethesda, where you can like find a potato in a toilet and like eat it? I mean, there's no toilets in Casa Doom. But I mean, is there like? But, but can you find of. food in silly places sometimes, you, like in Bethesda games? Well, it's funny when our friend Thomas plays uh, uh, Fallout New Vegas. He plays on survival mode, so you have to drink water, and he only drinks from toilets. <laughs> <laughs> That's a weird way to play it. <laughs> Uh, no, you can't, like, uh, l- luckily you don't have to also keep a water meter filled in this game. Um, just the food meter. Um, but food gives you uh, several different buffs. One is, like, a larger stamina pool. Uh, you mm. get better battle effectiveness. Um, you can have more time before you start to feel hunger again, so it just keeps you full longer, so you can have longer, I guess, like, uh, little missions out, if you will. Okay. Um, like I said, meals can't be taken with you. The spoil and rations um, you can take with you so you don't have to eat crappy food all the time like mushrooms. Nice. Okay. I also found the dwarves are pretty hardy when it comes to food, though, because you can just eat raw meat <laughs> and there's no <laughs> negative effect for it. Man, when Gimli said meat ripe off the bone, yeah, he, 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 yeah. he really meant it. This is still it's warm. Like the snack rats, it's still warm. The snack rats are like the most abundant like meat source you can find. You could just kill one if you're starving and take the meat and just eat it right there. No problem. It's Ooh. called a snack rat? It's called a snack rat. Oh my God, that's mm. disgusting. They're snacking on. Oh. <laughs> Gollum would agree. Yeah. yeah. Give it to us raw and wriggling. <laughs> you keep nasty chips. <laughs> We then have brews, uh, which d- they just give you buffs. They don't they don't affect your hunger at all. Um, so they're they're used for like more attack power or poison resistance, which is a very useful one when you're on the Pilgrim's Road. Cool. Um, and yeah, you just you take it, you put it in your hand, you drink it four times, and then you get the buff, and then you could sing that song like I said earlier. Um, you could take them with you in a brew skin, which is pretty cool. So if you want to take mm. a brew outside of your camp, you can bring it with you. Nice. Oh, so generally brews are only something you can have at camp, unless. Brewskin. Yeah, yeah brews brewskin. and cooking food you only do at camp, which is why you need the rations. I gotcha. Okay, gotcha. that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Very realistic. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so then we have the away from camp activities. Um, so like exploring, discovering Moria. The game has a has a big map that's generated when the world is created. Like I said, when you start, it's based on the seed. And the map is grid-based, which makes exploration a bit predictable. Uh, but this is also kind of helpful to prevent getting lost and for finding new places to go because you can kind of just look at your map and you can just tell on the map where the different doorways might be yeah when i saw your map i was a little surprised because initially i was expecting you know like some big sprawling map with you know oddly shaped areas and things but it's not that at all it's literally grids it's like a series of yeah square chambers it doesn't 
feel like grids as much while you're in the caves, but when you look at the map, it... I suppose that makes it easy to look at and understand where you are. Which is really nice, yeah. As much as I kind of don't like that, I also like it. I'm not going to go into more detail. <laughs> <laughs> not going to go into more detail on that. Uh, but yeah, each of the different um, areas are separated by a layer of rock that you usually have to mine through, so sometimes you need better tools to get through them. Mm. And uh, each uh, area kind of has its own like stuff in it to, to go and gather so you can craft other things. Very cool. Um, your character has stamina and energy. These are two different meters. Uh, running around and doing things takes stamina and energy. Sprinting and mining and certain fighting actions are some of the most typical ways that you will use them uh, to drain your stamina and energy. Um, and you have like a base stamina value that can be buffed up by eating food and singing songs and stuff. And it's displayed as like small little vertical bars. So getting buffs just gives you more bars and it recovers on its own when you stop doing things. Oh, okay. Um, so pretty typical stamina regeneration. Pre- pretty typical. Yeah. So resting comes into play when it comes to energy because as you're going out and about and doing all the things, it'll drain your energy just as time goes on even. And this has a negative effect on your stamina. So the lower your energy level, the less stamina you have. And the only way to heal your energy is to sleep. And that kind of sucks. Yeah. So the way I think you'd uh, explain it to me is your energy essentially dictates what your max stamina can be. Yes. Ah, that makes sense. Like food buffs and stuff can still get like up it a bit, but it yeah it drastically decreases as you're as you're tired i see and so like i personally i spent a lot of time exhausted and tired with only one tiny bar of stamina because it was too (laughs) tedious to go back to base (laughs) i just suffered through it yeah i honestly i'm not really a fan of the stamina or the armor system in this game um i don't think it's difficult enough to make these uh systems anything more than annoying is uh is there a difficulty setting? No. There oh there is no difficulty no. setting. Base difficulty. That's unfortunate. So like even if the game was harder, the only ways to make it harder because it's a pretty simple like interactions with like battle and stuff. All they could really do is make things hit you harder. Yeah. Which would just kind of be annoying. Mm-hmm. So it, it is what it is. That's one thing I didn't really care for, but uh because I like to go out and explore for a long time. I like to fill my inventory, bring it all back, and then craft up stuff. Yeah. And uh the buffs that you get from like eating food and, and things, they don't really last any more than a few minutes to like maybe a little bit longer if it's a brew. So like you don't have a lot of time to go out and do things while you still are at peak condition. Oh. Yeah, that is kind of I don't want to say useless, but it makes it hard to actually do anything beneficial with those buffs they lean in really heavy to the crafting and making food parts of the game which is fine it's just like it doesn't feel as beneficial as it could be speaking about beneficial things uh there are two things you can actually craft without a hearth that are useful quick platforms and ladders uh which are basically just like like a a little wood bridge yeah and a ladder that is on a platform i definitely saw you using both of these things frequently to try to get places yeah, it's easy to like close gaps or uh, t- to get above enemies and just walk over top of them. Oh, they don't even know you're there, which that's is pretty really fun. funny. To that's think cool. About that. If they if they see like your stuff, they'll try to damage it if they see you on it and break it. But if they don't see you, no problem. Um, you can you can like use them to like build like just little quick walls so enemies can't get you as easily uh, to block your way off or to keep them from coming after you. I've used it to like get out of the hordes and just like chill somewhere so they can't hit me. <laughs> you know, it's uh, easily exploitable. You just have to have a, like a stable surface to build them from, so like walls or the ground. They do still have structural integrity, so you can only build like four out from a wall or something like that before they'll just break and you can't make the bridge longer. But if you just link it to like another wall close by, you're probably fine. Okay. Uh, let's get into combat, the fighting. Uh, generally, I found that combat kind of consists of you just trading blows with enemies. Like the easiest thing to do is like poke them a couple times and then block their attack and then poke them a couple times and then you just keep doing that. Like a turn-based RPG kind of? Kind of, but in real time. But in real time. But in real time, yeah. You just got to know. Uh, it's pretty easy to know, but you just got to know when it's safe to attack and when it's not. Okay. So y- your weapons and shield take durability damage from blocking and attacking, so they can wear out mid-battle, which kind of sucks if they do. Um, as long as you keep on top of your repairs, though, it really shouldn't be an issue. Cool. Um, so like the, the Shadow Curse, the dorks, the dorks. <laughs> the dorks. The dorks. The dorks. <laughs> These fucking the, dorks. The orcs that have the shadow curse, you can block the the curse if you have a shield, but if you block with like a spear, it still affects you, which kind of sucks. So having a shield is very useful when you're fighting those orcs. Okay. 
Uh, and then there's the whole ho- thing about a horde that I mentioned. So any action you take in an area where an orc stronghold is still there can alert a horde. You've got a little like th- symbol at the bottom of your screen that kind of like blinks to tell you how close you are to alerting a horde. Is it because you're like being too loud or something or just... Yeah, yeah. Like if you're mining or something, it, it like each hit will have a, increase your chance of a, gotcha. a horde spawning. Okay, okay. And so a horde is usually just orcs and other baddies like wargs or bats and stuff that just relentlessly spawn and swarm you for a bit. It sounds bad, but it's really easy to exploit the AI and stay safe or just to slaughter them. Like uh, like I said, trading blows, I sat in a corner, blocked, and just attacked, and they all just kind of filed in as I killed them all one by one. Do you get any resources from these members of the horde that you kill? Yeah, hordes are very good for finding black diamond, which the orcs are very fond of. You just, okay. have, to, you just have to kill a lot of them. <laughs> and uh, hordes of orcs can also be summoned to your camp regardless if there's a stronghold or not. So they, they can just come and attack you whenever. Uh, speaking of the orc strongholds, though, uh, it's just a big kind of area with orc structures that have the big bad orc boss. Like Orc Town, you just find several of those, and they each have one of those tribes of orcs that we had talked about. Okay. And taking them out will prevent the, the hordes and stuff from coming after you, which is kind of nice, but only in those areas. Okay. Um, so you, you can't entirely get rid of hordes, but you can lessen them. Yeah. Yeah. You can, uh, you can definitely make areas safer, as m- it were. Mitigate the problem. Uh, we have boss battles as well, which they do tend to just be like fights against bigger versions of basic enemies with like big health pools and some unique moves. Okay. Uh, oftentimes you are also having a horde come at you while you're fighting the boss. Nice. Yeah. As it is in video games. Yeah. As it is. Yeah. Um, it was kind of hard at first to deal with that, but yeah, I figured it out pretty quick and then they all real kind of easy. Okay. Uh, and then if you're player health. The player has a static amount of max health, so like 100 out of 100. Like Think of about it that way. And none of your buffs ever give you more health. Gotcha. Okay. So your max health is always what it is. It's always what it is. Armor works like extra health. Like you just have some extra bars to take damage from before you take health damage. And better armor has higher durability, which means more health. So I'm not really a fan of how the armor worked. Like I said, uh, I don't like that it's like just extra health that you can't recover without repairing it. I think it would have been better if it was like extra defense so you just became hardier Mm -hmm. and not just like extra health. I spent a lot of time without any armor because the game was so easy I didn't need it. Oh, okay, cool. So so I was tired. I didn't have any stamina or armor and I was just walking around with with my regular ass health for a lot of the game because (laughs) it was too much of, of a tedious annoyance to go back to base. Just walking around, beat to shit, in Moria, just like... <laughs> an exhaust, and, and beaten and, dwarf. Hey, what do you think that says for the dwarves, though? Even if they're all fucked up... They're, they're hardy. They're hardy, and they're, they're still better, <laughs> more formidable than anything else in there. Hardy is the race of Aule. I was just about to... Is that what you were going to say? say that. That's funny. The race of Aule, yes. Finally, we have buffs and debuffs, or beneficial and detrimental effects. Um, we ta- we've talked a bit about them so far. And the game has a big emphasis on stacking a bunch of them. And stacking is just having multiple active on you at the same time. Combining and effects. Com- combining things. effects, yeah. Okay. So you just get more and more. And and like I had said, my major gripe is that the buffs don't have a long enough duration. So I was, yeah. I, yeah, I just didn't have many buffs most of the time because I could barely get anything done before they wore off. But the different things that give you buffs, um, food, brews, singing songs, sleeping, rebuilding monuments, um, they all get different buffs. And you can stack as many of them as you want, uh, which is kind of nice. I mean, I guess you can just get a bunch of buffs. Like, I had a very long list on the side of my screen of different things. I was almost going to comment and say that sounds kind of broken. But considering how short those buffs last, I guess maybe not. Yeah, you can be you can be pretty tough, I'll say, for a little while. For a little while. <laughs> And then uh, the debuffs that you get are mostly just by becoming exhausted, uh, getting poisoned by the mushrooms, um, or cursed by the shadow curse. Oh, makes sense. So, And those are all just things that lower your health. Gotcha. And that, whew, okay, that was a lot of stuff about Return to Moria, guys. Yeah, that was, can, can we have a, a round of applause for Trevor's, uh, his uh, his second episode? Holy Amazing shit. Work. Amazing, Amazing work. work. Look at this. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my God, Trevor. Yeah, you're probably exhausted right now. Well done, my friend. <laughs> yes. I, I feel like I've played this game without having played it. Yeah, what, a, I do what pre- a thorough uh, analysis of this game. Wow. This has gotten me very excited, and I do plan on getting this game just to play through and find all these little lore bits and Easter eggs everywhere. It does, it does sound like this is right up my alley. I'm not a huge, huge gamer. I'm a very casual gamer, but I, I love this lore, especially dwarven lore. So I will be getting and playing through this yeah. sometime in the near future. 
I uh, am even more casual still, and I, I do not have a machine that will run it. So uh, maybe Joel can stream it on Discord for everybody. That'd be fun. Hell yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. I well, definitely rate this game a lot better than Gollum. Okay. Okay. Like, That's good to know. Like, even though I, I said, like, you know, it's kind of mid for its actual gameplay, and it's not like the quality of gameplay. It's just that it hasn't, it doesn't do anything particularly special. Gotcha. Um, but the, but like the lore stuff, everything makes sense. It, it is a nice complete whole, and it doesn't like, it doesn't make any egregious things come out like Gollum. Yeah, right. And it it's, functions. It's, it's a functions. functioning game. It's a it's, functioning game. And it's all believable. Like, right. Every single thing, unless I knew for sure that it was canon, I needed to look it up because I, I could not yeah, be sure. Yeah, it's like that sounds... It sounds like it could be yeah, real. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But some final thoughts. Overall, super cool to be a dwarf and explore a world based on Tolkien's Moria. Hell yes. I would love to explore Khazad Doom. Yes. Like we said, the, the liberties taken on lore weren't too egregious, and for the most part... They all make sense. Yes, I was impr- I was thoroughly impressed throughout this an entire game and all the information I was able to get from you and just everything in this outline, all the lore, all the names they come up with, everything is solid. And while I, I think the game was too easy most of the time, um, the emphasis is definitely more on the gathering and crafting stuff than the battle. Despite that, you know, however, it does kind of suck having such a limited space to build in because you're in these like enclosed caves and stuff. And while there are some big areas... Uh, the world isn't endless. You know, you can't just keep exploring and going deeper and having the map keep generating. It does have a finite size. So spending time on like building a cool base or like a big base somewhere, it didn't really feel as worth it because you're kind of mm. just going through each area. So you just need like one main base with all your main crafting stuff and then little bases for fast travel. I see. Okay. Not much of a point in building a base and coming back to some of these small areas. Yeah. The My main base ended up being like this big in the air on some wooden scaffolding that was built into the game already, so it counted as a structural foundation. It was cool. I saw it. And yeah, it was it was super cool, and hordes couldn't get me. So Nice. So <laughs> yeah, I, And that was in uh, Karadharas. That was in the hardest area of the game, which oh, was cool. super funny that I was able to get away with that. That's funny as shit. Uh, and lastly, if you're new to crafting and survival games, this would be a totally fine place to start. Uh, it's, it's not too difficult of a game, as long as you're paying attention. The tutorials are good enough to learn, and uh, even just by like general ex- uh, experimentation, it's like you can figure stuff out really quickly, which I appreciate. I think overall we can safely say that KOT endorses this game. Yeah, I would say we it gets the KOT seal of approval. Would you agree, Trevor? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we don't tell you what to do with your money, but, you know, maybe go buy this game. I mean, this it, game was even cheaper than Gollum. This game was only 40 bucks. Oh, hell yeah. If it's that cheap. I th- uh, yeah. I thought this was another $70 adventure. No. no? Cheaper no. than Gollum. Oh, my way God. Way better. It seemed like it was... It seemed like it was a little bit longer, like there was more to do. And it's, yeah. it's more of a Tolkien game. It yes. fits well within, not just like the lore, but the feel. Yes. Like it fits way more with the feel of what you want like a Tolkien game to be about. That's awesome. I'm I'm stoked that this game was not as much of a dumpster fire, or, uh, well, a dumpster fire at all, let alone as much of a dumpster fire as Gollum was. Yeah. yeah. As far as actual reviews of the game go, if you guys look online, you'll probably see people giving it pretty mid ratings. Mm-hmm. But those, like I said, like that's my gameplay rating. But, yes. But the, the lore and story and all the other stuff, if you're a nerd, you... 10 out of 10. Really great stuff. Which is, yeah. And if you're listening to this podcast, you're a fucking nerd. I hate to tell you. Yeah, if you're still listening right now, you're a nerd. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, You know... I'm sorry, but you know, <laughs> sorry not sorry. This sorry your, not sorry. This is your confirmation. Welcome to the family. Is all I gotta say. You've earned your nerd coin. Yes. And really, I think as a as a dwarf head myself, I've been waiting for a proper installment of some kind of media a respectful a respectful coverage of the dwarves the hobbit did not do it very far from it i was i was very upset you guys you you guys probably know that by now episode one two three (laughs) yeah very upset about how what the hobbit movies did to dwarves but yeah uh, the the show the the recent rings of power show was all right with dwarves Mm -hmm. wasn't perfect but this nailed it this this ooh chef's kiss yes all right guys well that's all from us this week tune in uh next week for episode 94 jesus christ 94 good lord uh and that's going to be tolkien mysteries 2 that's right you guys remember tolkien mysteries we're bringing it back we're bringing it back for a second go tolkien mysteries 
Thanks for listening, though. Um, uh, this is KOT Podcast. Subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts and stay up to uh, date on new episodes and rate and review and, you know, do all that fun stuff. If you like us, that'd be really friggin' nice of you. And a huge thank you to our patrons on Patreon. Uh, subscribing on Patreon helps support us and it also unlocks some exclusive content for you. So go and check it out. That's patreon.com forward slash KOT podcast. We also do private one time donations if that's more your speed. We've got PayPal and other services. Just uh, hit us up and we'll make something happen. We're grateful for anything you're willing to offer. You should also give us a follow on our social media channels. Uh, we are on Discord, which is probably the best way to get in touch with us. There will be a link in the description. You can find us on TikTok at keep underscore on underscore Tolkien underscore podcast. We are on X, formerly Twitter, at KOT podcast. We are on Facebook at official keep on Tolkien and Instagram at keep on Tolkien podcast. And don't forget, we also have a merch store. We got some cool stuff on there. If you want to get some KOT themed merch, that is at tmail at keep dash on dash Tolkien dash podcast dot tmail dot com. All right, Tolkieners, that was a long one, but a good one. I'm Danny J. And I'm Joel N. And I'm Trevor D. And together, we are Keep Keep on on Tolkien. Tolkien. All right, and Sound like a dwarf. That's what I tried for. Thank you, Joel. God, I'm so proud of myself. That's what I was trying.